Why don't you name every board member? Uh, Bernie McIntyre. John Mizrock. Sandra Madison Fraud. Dana Weatherburn. Donna. Donna? I'm sorry, Donna Cooper. So we have five out of five. Seven. 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 We want to check who's on the phone. Donna, Chairman Kane, anybody else? This is Veronique speaking. No. Okay, well, so do I need... Go ahead. I, I don't think that audit is a good report because it was supposed to be for the full board. Just if you're talking about the audit, that's probably not a good thing to... Uh, we to want to first review the... Uh, the you know, it's, it's difficult without the full board because the full yes. board needs everything. Okay. So if you're expecting more people, why don't we just wait? We could, we could wait, um, but there's someone right now. Who just joined? No, I said Anne. I was just coming back on. Oh. I got okay. disconnected. Now we understand. So um, same thing for the minutes, Bernice. You would like to wait? Um, yeah, well, the minutes, I mean, you have to vote for the minutes. Exactly. So the problem is, and the audit was specifically asked for, and that the bylaws discussion I think it is also one that we need the full board for. Okay. So can we wait a few minutes? We can wait a few minutes. We we will uh, we will need to be mindful that F. S. Taylor does need to leave at ten. So that's one reason I was also trying um, to to push that. If we do not do, I mean, first I'd like to. Can we approve of the agenda with a partial board and see if everybody's reviewed the agenda and can approve of it? Well, in theory, you can't, but. We Gary, you can. Look at we, we can, can look, look at, at it. What about comments is, at this point? Is um. So we're just missing. And, and is Hussein he, here? Yeah, Hussein yes. could do that. He could do oh, that. Larry's here. Yeah, Larry. Larry. Oh, okay, we're, we're good. We're good. good. Yeah, we got. We have it. We yeah. Got we the have the quorum. quorum. <laughs> okay. Around the room, yes, I will. Thank you. I'm getting some directions, obviously, because I've not chaired before, and I appreciate them. So, when one thing we do now that we have a full board. Um, I will ask the board members to reintroduce themselves and everybody in the room as well, and that will start the meeting. Sandra Maddow-Bufry, People's Council. Thank you. Uh, Dan Wetterburn, I re represent the council chair. Bernice McIntyre, representing Washington Gas. Larry Martin, uh, Sierra Club. Uh, John Mizrock, representing uh, Councilwoman Chair. Veronique Marnier, Energy Administration. Teresa Lawrence, DDOE, Energy Administration. Uh, Lance Long, DDOE. Uh, why don't we do the phone? Because yeah. there are board yes. members on the phone. Absolutely. The phone. People uh, on the phone. Debbie Ann Kane, Public Service Commission. Donna Cooper, Pepco. Thank you. Dan Clarendon, Public Service Commission. Hussein Green, DDOE. Nicole Cedar, Roman Office, People's Council. Anna Green, DCS Ricky Grant, No Power. Chef Stanish, O Power. Isaac Cotton, DOE. Marcus Walker, DC. John Sonoria, OPC. Steve Slender, DC Sun. Pamela Nelson, OPC. Ted Troy, DC SEU. Todd Douglas, DGS. George Nichols, DC SEU. Chris Powell, FS Taylor. Rachel Lopez, FS Taylor, and his own team. Muhammad Ali, DDOE Finance. Frank Taylor, FFC, We have Lenora Hall as well in the room, DDOE. Um, with that, we would like an approval of the agenda, um, which everybody should. Um, I move to approve the agenda. Second. Second. Any vote on that? Everybody's okay? Favor. Yeah. Favor. Opposed. Yeah. Um, the next item is we in. We have voted to approve the agenda. Yes. We have voted to approve the agenda. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
We'd like, with that, I would like everybody to turn to their folders where you have uh, minutes of two meetings, June 4th and June um, 13th. As suggested by some board member, we have sent those ahead of time, including, you know, um, did some editing ahead of time. However, some of the editing came slightly late, so you will find um, two pages that are on their own from OPC in Washington Gas of comments that are not included right in the minutes, but after the approval of these minutes will be. Um, so we would like to, I guess, see if there's any additional comments. Where are the Washington Gas comments? The Washington Gas comments uh, are stated with Washington Gas. Okay, you I, have see them. I see it. And they are kind of high, you know, highlighted. Mm -hmm. And if I can just add to that, with regard to the Washington Gas comment, on page 8 on the flip side, comment B1, the first sentence we incorporated into the um, the original minutes on the last, on the... Sorry, the 613. Okay, on the last page of the six, of the June 13th minutes, we put that first sentence that Washington Gas proposed, but on the second half of the comment required going back to the um, to the tape to listen to to get more context surrounding that. So we will be doing that. And then so I see that on page eight yes. of your these minutes the you've got highlighted yes, what you've added and this the larger full copy of the minutes. Mm -hmm. okay. And I also made a comment about the bylaws issue of that immunity. I made a oh. comment that, that we had voted to adopt the vice chair in the language of the bylaws. Is that incorporated? In the no, that was not. That would be that would be on the June fourth right. minutes, and that was reflected in the on page two of the June fourth minutes, the second to last paragraph. Which what page? Um, um, page two of June two. The, act, the actual language for the motion is stated in the quotations. You are asking for some clarification to that. Okay, so that's in the revised minutes is what I'm trying to find out. In, no, the, in the, the June 13th? No, this would have been in the June 4th minutes. Um, with regard to the vice chair issue? Right. The right, third so paragraph. the actual language for the motion that was passed, where you, your comment was that may not slash shall not, you wanted some more to know um, whether that's what we voted. Right. Um, we have not, we didn't get a chance to go back to the tape as yet, so no, so no, no changes that. were made to that, but we do have that comment. Right, but you did, did we, we adopted the change to the bylaw, right? Yes. Okay, and that's in that, in the minutes yes. here? Yes. Okay, so that's, that's good, but you might have to change the language slightly. Once you look at the yeah. exactly. All right. So there may be some additional revisions to the June 4th, depending the June on what the front. transcript mm -hmm. says, because I thought we decided whether it was may not or shall not. Mm -hmm. yes. So mm -hmm. having both is sort of confusing. Mm -hmm. Although I think shall not will take precedence over may. may. <laughs> but, right. Yeah. I think the change to shall not, that yeah. was one of the recommendations right. to make it stronger. Right. Mm -hmm. Any, anything else? And I don't know if we can move on at least the June 13 minutes. Anything, any other comments from anybody on the minutes? On the, uh, well, I think we can't adopt the June 13th because we haven't finalized them. The June 4th or 13th? The June 13th. Yeah, but the 4th. Oh, oh, the 4th, oh, that's oh, what so I was going to say. The 4th, yeah, the 4th. The 4th, we cannot. Because we don't know mm -hmm. what, what the, the language, language is in. Yeah. Exactly. But the June 13th, unless there's other comments, could be moved to adopt. And you're accepting the comments that we made in terms of the June 4th. Mm -hmm. June 4th. Mm -hmm. okay. And is that so stated in the, uh, the minutes, the comments? Some, uh, 
I haven't read the, the June the OPC comments. Yeah, they were and, more and, and the Larson gas comments, I think. So the June 13th, I don't think I had any comments. Okay. Does someone want to move to adopt? The June 13th. I move that we adopt the June 13th <coughs> minutes. Now, do I need to ask for a vote? Is that yep. yes? <laughs> please, please vote on the adoption of June 13th. All in favor? All in favor. Yeah. Aye. Uh, Aye. Any uh, objections? Any opposed? Any Sorry, opposed? Sir. Any objection? Any opposed? Good. Okay. So it passed. Passed. Um, and we will have this as a, the adoption of June 4th as a pending item for the next for the next meeting. Um, the next item on the agenda is the DCSEU uh, fiscal year 12 financial audit report, which the board uh, members have, have asked and you know to get a presentation on. So I want to thank in advance uh, the FS Taylor and Associates and invite them to uh, to present. Good morning again, folks. Uh, FS Taylor and Associates uh, will retain our DDOE to conduct a financial audit of the DCSU, particularly the SCTF funds that were paid to the DCSU during fiscal year 2012. Uh, we also retained FS Taylor to conduct the first audit that we did on fiscal year 2011, albeit that audit was conducted sometime in 2012. Actually, we didn't get the final report in 11 until about October of 2012. So when they started this process to do fiscal year 2012 audit, you will notice that some of the same findings uh, reoccurred because of the timing with when the first audit was done. Uh, nonetheless, FS Steel is here this morning to present the findings on the FY12 audit. We have not made any decision as to how we'll move forward with auditing FY13, but we thought the board should at least get an idea of how the DCSU has been performing financially. They did also take a look at some of the things in the contract that were also tied to dollars. For example, if we paid any performance incentive, they reviewed uh, the criteria for the performance incentive to ensure that we did not overpay or underpay for any of those performance incentives. They also take a look at the CBE spending requirement to ensure that the DCSU did meet the required 35% for FY11 and 50% of implementation dollars for FY12. Uh, third piece that financially related that they took a look at too is the requirements of the expenditures on gas and electric uh, related programs. So these things will be presented here this morning by FS Taylor and Associate. Uh, we have Frank Taylor, who I believe is the lead principal here. Uh, Rachel Lucas is a teaming partner, and uh, Chris is the project manager, so to speak, of the audit team that conducted the review of DCSEU books. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Alfred Taylor to walk us through the presentation. Okay, well, thank you, Lance. Uh, needless to say, we're happy to be here and uh, make this presentation. We think it's important that uh, we talk to the board that's uh, governing whatever organizations that we for audits for. Now this audit was, was indicated was performed for financial and compliance uh, of the DC Stable Energy uh, Utility. Uh, what we're doing here is financial and bringing it in, uh, indicated to some degree that we look at some of the compliance items in the contract between the Stable Energy Utility and between uh, the VEIC to make sure that they complied with what was required in the contract. So we're going to move right along. Uh, next page. The presentation will look similar to what we have here, and we'll go through it uh, at a pretty quick pace. Uh, we certainly will have time for some questions afterwards. The engagement team has been introduced. Rachel Lopez is the uh, engagement partner. Chris Powell is the engagement manager. These folks have a lot of information, a lot of knowledge uh, regarding uh, 
uh, this contract. So moving right along, we're going to talk about the scope and the objective. What our scope was and what did we uh, try to achieve. Uh, go back. Okay. Very good. The, the services we provided were financial examination of the ST, SETF funds for the DC SEU for the year ended September 30, 2012, as I already been mentioned. We are testing compliance with contract requirements as established in the contract, and the audit was performed in accordance with our AICPA industry standards of, in, of, in accordance with generally accepted auditing standards and in accordance with government auditing standards because it's also related to a government entity. Methodology. As part of our audit process, we developed and enhanced our understanding of the contract terms and requirements, as well as relevant DCSEU operations. We actually went out to VEIC offices to review documentation and processes. We tested the monthly billings to DDOE and related costs reported by the DCSEU to ensure that they were uh, accurate as far as just the mathematical, the, the, act, the, the adding and subtracting and all those things were correct. We also looked at the adequacy of the supporting documentation of the reported expenditures as related to the contract period, which we would consider the cutoff to make sure that those expenditures were incurred before September 30, 2012. We looked for authorization, authorizing signatures for those expenditures as well. We reviewed and tested the internal controls for the DCSEU accounting system, and we reviewed and tested pertinent contract compliance requirements. This effort also included us interviewing, interviewing DEIC staff, um, DEOE staff, DCSEU staff. Um, we tested samples of all these supporting documentation for the expenditures, as I said, and ensure that they were in compliance with the contract compliance requirements. Can I ask a question? Did you find them to be in compliance? And, and, re, and our results will be reflected in the remaining of the documentation. All right. The uh, first area that we looked at as part of the audit was related to uh, certain performance benchmarks. Uh, the majority of the contract was for actual costs spent on the program, but uh, DCSEU was also uh, able to attain certain uh, additional funds uh, if they achieve uh, certain benchmarks outlined in the contract. Uh, out of $420,000 of those performance benchmarks, uh, we found that $125,000 uh, was achieved. Uh, the measurement uh, of these goals was actually uh, done by a third-party consultant contracted by DDOE uh, to assure that DCSU actually met these uh, performance benchmarks. Uh, as it relates to uh, green jobs creation, which was another performance benchmark, uh, we found that the SEU did not earn any of these money as it did not create enough new uh, green jobs during the year. Uh, we also found that data submitted to DDOE as part of the uh, green job calculation uh, was estimated and was not finalized data. Uh, and we found that the data submitted was not um, in line with what we saw as a result of the audit. Next slide. Excuse me. Um, the first bullet, would you explain that a little more clearly? Um, out of possible 420,000, Sure. So the, the contract has, uh, I believe, uh, aside from the green jobs incentive, it has five other uh, performance benchmarks that the DCSU can attain. Uh, each, of the, each of these benchmarks had a dollar value assigned to it so that if it was achieved, uh, these funds would be distributed to the DCSU. Uh, in total, these added up to $420,000 that they could attain. The, the 125 came as a result of the DCSEU surpassing the benchmark for uh, low income spending and the benchmark for reduction in peak demand. The, believe, I believe it was uh, a little less than 4 megawatt reduction in peak demand, which resulted in the $5,370 associated with that benchmark being paid. 
um, the 120,000 was the full amount available for the low income uh, benchmark. Uh, the next area we looked at was uh, all of the required reports as outlined in the contract. Uh, we found that all of the monthly, quarterly, and annual reports uh, were submitted uh, as required by the contract. Uh, the next area we looked at was related to expenditures uh, related to natural gas and electricity programs. Uh, the methodology that we reviewed uh, used to determine the allocation of costs between these projects. Uh, was found to be reasonable and was approved by DDOE during the contract period. However, we did find that the uh, ratio of gas to electricity related measures, uh, which was found to be 5 to 95, did not meet the uh, compliance requirement outlined, outlined in the contract, which was uh, 20 to 80. Next slide. Uh, of course, another compliance requirement outlined in the contract was that the SEU maintain a physical office within uh, the District of Columbia. Of course, they have an office location uh, on M Street. Uh, the next area we looked at was related to the ownership of materials, data, and products. Uh, the contract states that all assets, uh, equipment, trademarks of the SEU project are to revert back to uh, DDOE at the uh, conclusion of the contract. Uh, we found that the DC SEU maintains a tracking log of all these items to ensure that uh, at the end of the contract these items can be uh, properly returned to DDOE. However, uh, well, we did find that the log did not contain acquisition costs of the assets, uh, so that if some of these assets were lost or replaced, it would be hard to determine uh, how much should be returned to DDOE. Uh, we also performed testing of uh, some subcontractor agreements to ensure that uh, agreements with these contractors uh, contain language that informed them that any assets under the program would revert back to DDOE at the uh, termination of the contract. Uh, the next area we looked at was uh, insurance requirements, and we found that the uh, minimum insurance policies required by the contract uh, were maintained throughout the contract period. Next, we looked at uh, expenditures related to uh, CBEs, or small, local, and disadvantaged businesses. Uh, the contract states that 50% of uh, implement, implementation contracts attributed to CBEs, I'm sorry, 50% of total implementation contracts should be attributed to uh, CBEs. Uh, we reviewed expenditures related to CBEs as well as the system used to track the CBE statuses. And we found that the DC SEU exceeded the 50% requirement. We did find, however, that two of the contractors included in the calculation did not have their CBE status. However, this did not impact the uh, calculation or the fact that they attained the 50% requirement. And why was that? The amount of expenditures related to those two business businesses did not uh, bring the total down to where it would be below the 50%. Have they since been certified? Do you know? Uh, I'm not sure. We, we haven't tested them. They weren't certified as of the time we did the audit. Right. Was, so you didn't count late April? You didn't count? No, they're not included in the calculation. But, uh, the DCSEU did exceed that 50% CPE requirement. The uh, Next area we reviewed was related to uh, project-related incentive payments. Uh, this year we reviewed a sample of 57 <laughs> incentive payments to customers, uh, and this was related to the installation of various, various energy-saving measures. Uh, we noted that 13 projects were not certified as completed until after the uh, contract performance period. We also found that six projects uh, did not have evidence that they were inspected. And we also noted one project where a customer was overpaid by $800, resulting in an overcharge to DDOE. Uh, finally, we noted one occurrence where the uh, software system used by the SEU to track measure installations uh, reported an incorrect amount of installations when compared to the uh, certification report.
Uh, finally, we looked at the uh, accounting for balance sheet accounts, which would be uh, any unused inventory, uh, fixed assets purchased, uh, as well as any security deposits that may have arisen uh, during the year. Uh, we noted that uh, expenditures such as these were being tracked by the SEU uh, via uh, asset tracking mode. And we noted that they track pertinent items such as security deposits, equipment, inventory, etc. Uh, through this law. The report also looked at the status of the prior findings, the findings of 2011, and we, we summarized those here as well, and the status that we found during our 2012 audit. But the FTE green jobs, last year we had a finding that related to the review of the certified payroll reports. We noticed that two reports didn't have authorizing signatures. During the 2012 audit, mm -hmm. we performed similar testing, but no exceptions were noted. I have a question about that. Are these authorized um, signatures from contractors being reported to the SEU, or are these signatures by an authorized person at the SEU reporting to DDOE? These were the signatures of the contractors, the subcontractors authorizing signatures. We also had a, a comment regarding the annual expenditures on natural gas related and electric, electricity related programs last year. The methodology used last year to determine the percentage wasn't clear and didn't account for the allocations to the gas and electric related projects in a manner that we felt was appropriate. Status is that during fiscal year 2012, the methodology was revised, as Chris indicated, and it was approved by DDOE. And in addition, we noted that the DCSEU implemented KID, a project tra tracking software, which facilitated that calculation. In 2011, under the contract requirement for ownership of materials, data, and products, we noted that assets purchased with DDOE funds were not being tracked. The status is, as of 2012, as we've indicated before, that the DCSEU has implemented an asset tracking law. Last year when we were testing project-related incentive payments, there were two incentive payments totaling $300,000 related to an energy retrofit project that were paid before the project was verified as completed. Our status for 2012 is that the DCSCU implemented a number of controls in response to, uh, to that finding, we believe, but we still indicated in the 2012 findings, as you noted, uh, earlier by Chris that there were some incentives that we tested that still were not being certified as completed by DCSEU. In 2011, we found a duplicate payment related to legal services made by the DCSEU in charge to DDOE. In the testing that we did for 2012, we saw no type of exceptions related to those, to duplicate payments. We found no exceptions. Under security deposits last year, we noted that the security deposits related to office space and apartments leased for DCSEU operations and staff were not being tracked. During the current year audit, 2012, the DCU implemented a tracking law to monitor security deposits and other assets. The next thing we want to do is review the summary of adjusted total spending for fiscal year 2012. DCSEU expended, according to our audit, $14.4 million. 
$14.9 million were, were budgeted. And that $14.4 million was comprised of $13.8 million in direct spending, including the operations fee of $527,000. We made audit adjustments, uh, proposed audit adjustments in DCSCU, accepted them, uh, related to $832, which was the $800 overcharge that Chris described related to the uh, incentives testing that we did, plus the $32 operations fee, which is 4%, which is 4%. Uh, we accrued $125,000 in the performance fees that we discussed earlier in the presentation by Chris. And then there's an accrual of 100, I'm sorry, $401,000 for the EMV study. All of those costs, the $125,000 thousand and the four hundred and one thousand were paid after fiscal year two thousand twelve. Those expenditures, the fourteen million point four million dollars would be considered um, expenditures in a, in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles in that we have accrued related ex expenditures for the DCSEU contract that were paid after fiscal year. Yes, well, first of all, I appreciate your coming and, and talking to the board. Uh, I think it's something we ought to repeat every year when you do the audit that the uh, board gets a opportunity to ask questions. Um, and um, and it, it certainly shows that there's been improvement between the years based on the things that uh, you've been able to identify to make sure that from a financial auditing perspective everything is uh, you know, good, which is helpful to the board as an advisory board and to DDOE. I don't know, based on your, your work with other types of contracts like this, are there other things that you would suggest to the board that be encompassed either in our contract or looked at to make sure that there wouldn't be, if you sort of look at standard practices um, that, that would be out of line? Um, you, know, you, you get to look at the books and you look at other companies, things like that. Are there general areas that you would recommend to the board that either or to DDOE that we look at more carefully or ask the SEU to, to do something slightly differently? Actually, we, uh, we reviewed the contract. Uh, we thought it was pretty clear as to the, con the requirements. Um, we identified what we thought were the financial compliance requirements along with DDOE agreed as to what we would actually be testing. This year we were asked to increase testing related to reviewing of the subcontracts with some specific information. Um, overall, we believe that uh, the DCSCU financial operations are sound and, and, and as reflected in the results. We, we, we found few problems. We tested a number of transactions. We didn't test 100% because that's not, uh, that was not our methodology. But if we had run into problems, we would have increased our sample and made sure that we had sort of captured any problems that we might have found in the testing. The system seemed sound. Um, if, we, if we had some recommendations from what we had from the work we performed, we would have also presented it in the report. So I believe that what we present today and what you'll see in the final document would be all the recommendations, all the things that we've done. And we believe that the scope of the work was more than adequate to address. So the scope of the work that, that DDOE is assigned to you in doing the audit is consistent with the normal scope of issues that you yes. do for yes, other agencies. Um, did you find anything, for, for instance, was there a high level of any types of expenditures that would be out of the norm for a corporation, whether it would be travel or anything like that, that you would, you know, make a recommendation in terms of looking at it from a, an advisory board perspective? Well, I, I think when you look at the nature of the contract, uh, that was not within the scope of what we were to do because the contracts allow VEIC to operate the SEU and achieve certain performance measures and achieve certain results. 
So internally, the way they would uh, achieve that, it's pretty flexible, I think. I think the end result is, do they accomplish the task that the contract acts uh, to be accomplished? So looking at uh, that would be sort of like a, that would be a different type of school to say, what GEO you know, salaries higher than normal nonprofit salaries or the administrative costs a lot higher. That's a, that's a different kind of school. We look more to see where the funds spent the way they were designed to be spent on things that related to uh, DCSEU as opposed to uh, looking at that's more of a management type review, which you know, is something that you know, we would have to consider all the funds being spent well uh, and, uh, and appropriately in, in accordance to how you, you feel it should be. That's so that would, be, that would be more of a management audit than a financial audit, yes. those types of questions. I have a question. Yes. Um, the uh, contract is a very complicated contract, but most of the board members uh, work with the DOE to put this thing together starting in 2009 or 2010. And, you know, the requirements are uh, green jobs and energy reduction, and certain percentage for natural gas and a certain percentage for electricity. So a couple of questions, which are, uh, since the uh, the SEU was didn't exist, so it was you know brand new, and they were obviously creating something that didn't exist in the district. I'm I'm curious as to how you went about educating yourself on this contract, since it was something that didn't exist before, and two. Um, you weren't asked in this audit, and Bernice sort of alluded to this, that you went into the financials, but uh, uh, as independent auditors, I'd like to get some reaction from you on, in terms of uh, uh, the contract itself and its goals, and, uh, and as Bernice was suggesting, maybe in you know future audits, uh, we could get some independent opinion on uh, going forward to accomplish the, the larger goal. So I'm curious uh, how you read yourself into this and what your reaction is. Well, I, I would answer a part of that at least. I think initially when we saw the uh, contract and did our review for the first audit that we, we did, one of the things we kept asking is, you know, where is the budget? You know, where are budget line items? Uh, that, that, you know, and a budget obviously tries to manage a process. So if we say, well, gee, uh, administrative salaries cannot exceed a certain dollar amount or a certain percentage, that would be one thing. Or travel couldn't exceed a certain dollar amount or a certain percentage. You know, that would be another uh, feature that a budget would have in it. Uh, my understanding is, and of course I was not there, but my understanding is the contract was, you know, a culmination of efforts of a number of people, and it was new. And there's no specific budget that VEIC by line item has to adhere to. So that would be one of the comments that, uh, you know, you, you might look at as you go forward or if you, you know, do a different, another contract down the road. Yeah. But again, as an advisory board, is that something you have the expertise in and the knowledge in and, and or, or the EDO staff would? But, you know, most processes of control, financial process are controlled by budget. Start with a budget uh, at the beginning. A proposal, say, from... I think it's DDOE that really would negotiate that budget. We're just advising. So that's a that's a I'm not saying it should something that has to be should be done. Mm -hmm. We haven't looked at it that closely to say that, but we didn't ask for that and we didn't look at that uh, in our review that mm -hmm. was, cause, cause typically we say, hey gee, if the ministry of salaries can only be I would say ten percent, then we make sure that it'll be ten percent. Mm -hmm. yeah, travel costs can only be five hundred thousand, then we look for that. But without that mm -hmm. You know, uh, you know, we, we just, we don't have a look. Yes, yeah, we probably have to five, ten minutes. <laughs> this, this is Donna Cooper. I have one question. I, I just want a clarification as it relates to what Bernice was recommending as it relates to additional information that could be contained within the actual audit. Um, what was she requesting? I wasn't re requesting anything, Donna. This is Bernice. I just was trying to figure out what was the scope as defined. And I think... Oh. Uh, the, the tailor and associates was saying the scope was strictly a financial audit 
which means they didn't get into whether the contract was managed right or any of those kinds of issues. And it's just something for DDOE and the board to, get, from my point of view, is to consider over the term whether we want to look at some of those other issues that are outside the present scope of this financial audit. And I guess also okay. that it was, you know, whether or not that would be a management type audit as opposed to a strictly financial audit. Exactly. All right, thank you. I think you had something, Sandra. Um, I just really wanted to, to follow up. Um, you generally found that they were sound, their financial report was sound, but you did note some omissions or areas for improvement. I assume that they will be making those adjustments. Now, I don't know if that's an FDCSEU question or not. We've already discussed these items with um, DCSEU, and I believe they have agreed to our comments. In the report, uh, we have FSTLA's recommendation and even DEIC's immediate response to those recommendations. The normal process is the DDOE will then send a letter to the DCSEU uh, confirming some of the findings and even for the suggestions on what we think needs to be implemented. As you can see, between 11 and 12, all of the recommendations were implemented, so to speak. Um, as it relates to the finding of the $832, DDOE certainly has requested those funds back with interest. It's part of the normal process. Anything that we found that's been overbilled to the district has to be returned to the district with any interest that have accrued over that period that the monies were outstanding. So the, the short answer is yes, the DCSU will be implementing the recommendations as put forward in the audit. Will there be an explanation as to why they didn't meet these um, requirements initially so that we know whether or not it's a you know, systemic impediment or something or just... Yes, certainly in the audit report there's a brief explanation and then if there's further details that are required, we would ask for those further details. For example, the $800 that you notice here in the overpayment and an incentive. Turns out that it was actually a manual error. Someone incorrectly inputted the amount of uh, measures into the system that generated a higher than uh, should have been rebate amount. So these type of controls, you know, are corrected and were corrected. You know, we now have higher levels of oversight at the DCSU as it relates to incentive payments. It's not just the program manager or the account manager. It then has to go up another two levels before the final check is issued. Yeah, I have a question, <clears throat> really, too. This is for SEU, I believe. Um, how much, um, how many FTEs, if that's what you need to call it, are, are spent each year or last year on uh, providing information so that an audit can be performed, plus all of these reports that you all provide not only us but others and then you prepare your uh, budgets and all. How many FTEs out of the total workforce in SEU is, is involved in this type of thing? That certainly is an SEU type question and they will have to, you know, provide uh, some insights as to how many folks they actually utilize in that process. <coughs> Mr. Weber, are you asking how many individuals either here in the District of Columbia or up in Burlington, because FS Taylor did go up to Burlington to interview a number of our staff members up here. Is that the question you're asking? How many people were involved in responding to the inquiries that were presented by the audit? No, uh, my question is more broadly. Uh, uh, it takes work with by SEU people or somebody to uh, to to be able to uh, provide to the auditors each year so they can conduct their audit. Uh, that's one example. There, there are lots of other things that you all have to produce, like uh, monthly reports, quarterly reports, annual budgets, and this and that. How many uh, equivalent FTEs out of your total are, 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 are being used for this? And the, the question relates to you know, this may be called administrative or whatever, versus people out working on the, 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 you know, trying to achieve the actual goals out there in the public arena. It's a great question. It's 
rather hard to, to give you an exact answer on that. I will say, of course, like any organization that's um, entrusted, as you can see, last year we spent $13.8 million. You have to necessarily have a financial house on the backside of that operation to make sure that all of the funds are, are spent appropriately. Of course, there are, are program managers in 10 different areas or so. As, as you mentioned, there was one mistake made related to uh, a customer incentive of $832. That was, by the way, on a project that was about $544,000. But, but, but all of our program managers have to go through and, and make sure that the incentive levels are set appropriately. And there's another level of, of double checking that math above and beyond that. Um, then, of course, as it relates to um, any of the other funds that we have, the reports that we have to produce and things like that, uh, there are, uh, on the reporting side, there are probably three people or four people involved at the minimum to create the, the reports that are generated to make sure that the public is, is adequately informed of, of the work that we do. And out of how many, what is your number of employees now, Rob? Inclusive of interns right now is 37. Okay. Eight interns. Okay. And my next question has to do, and I might have missed this, but I don't think so. Uh, again, to the SEU, there is being an evaluation conducted by, I think it's Tetra Tech, or at least Tetra, uh, of, of, the, uh, of the program. And where does that stand now? Is that finished? Yes, we finished the EM&V process. Uh, if you recall, Tetra Tech briefed the board on the findings of that EM&V uh, for fiscal year 2012. Okay. And, and how much did that cost? How much did you pay them to, to do that? The entire contract is 699000 but they haven't exhausted that entire amount. Um, it didn't just include FY12, but it's FY12 and part of the preparation for FY13 that they're doing right now. So it, it's a, a split between the years of how much the cost will be. Um, but we can, you know, try to extrapolate what is the exact amount associated with the FY12 lift. Do you think that's the last one? Do you think that's a reasonable amount to spend to conduct an annual event? Um, yes, given that this is a more or less startup evaluation process and there are a number of things that had to be put in place and reviewed, you know, establishing a framework, you know, establishing a, a TRM, which is a technical reference manual, to make sure that we can build from these uh, processes moving forward. In the out years, for example, next year and beyond, we don't anticipate to pay nowhere close to, you know, 600 plus thousand, but when you have to set the foundation, it usually costs, you know, a significant amount to do so. Yeah, Dan, I've read that you can expect to spend as much as 10% of your total budget for a thorough EMD <coughs> program. So we're paying under 10% at this point, which is not too bad. How do you calculate the under 10%? Well, if you're talking about the overall budget of the SEU being at, what, 15? Yeah. 15. 15.8. Okay. Well, it would be in a contract amount as a... As a Larry's pointing out, so it would have been 1.5 million, so to speak, you know, as a budget for the uh, EM and V costs, and we're nowhere near those things. Yeah. We, we reviewed that pretty carefully, actually, because that was a concern, even at the 10%, we was no, not there, that was a concern, you know, we kind of really sat down and made sure that we had the right foundation, but, you know, didn't move on. Uh, Dan, I don't know if you have any other items, I just want to make sure that the DCSCU um, is presenting their program, and you're slotted for about 45 minutes. I kind of expended a little bit of time at the first, because when I added the time, we had, you know, two hours planned, and we have three hours. But I want to make sure also that the SU has 45 minutes plus questions. So I'm just going to do a last round if we're good with questions. There was, there was one. Yeah. There was one. Yeah. And I know you have to go to 10 as well. There was one final piece to this yeah. question that we didn't respond to. <clears throat> as part of the audit process, we reviewed the contract. Um, we spent days. Okay. Uh, discussing it with DEOE, DCSEU, and DEFC staff. Mm -hmm. But FS Taylor and Associates has been in business for 33 years, and a large part of our work effort is related to 
uh, state and local government effort. So the contract was something that we were able to review without any issues and, yeah. uh, and test appropriately. So, uh, well, first of all, Thank you all very much for your effort. We're uh, just delighted that you did this. And appreciate the results. And I would suggest that um, we consider, you know, I think I very much appreciate the budgeting suggestion. I think that's foundational and that's a good thing to look at going forward. Um, and, but I also want to get into, uh, uh, in the future, into the sort of, uh, quality versus quantity issue that we've had discussions around, numerous discussions at this table, in terms of the work itself. So uh, since you all have had this experience, I'm wondering if going forward you think about um, uh, designing some independent reviews. I think one of our consultants, Tetratech, your consultants, is doing this, but maybe we can have another group come at it another way, you know, so that we get into we have an independent analysis from an independent group that talks about quality versus quantity type of thing. So I don't know how exactly we do that, but I think it would be well worth the effort. So. Anyway, that's my only comment. Thank, thank you all. From my perspective, thank you. Thank you. So, yes. Um, Thank you. And I'm not sure who's presenting, but probably several people from the DCSE is, is next. <coughs> and I guess that's a continuation of the fiscal year 2014 annual plan. We have some. I think the next one up is, according to the agenda, is the bylaws. Oh, you are right. Sorry, I had yeah. Uh, but um, I think that will be relatively quick. Or, sorry. Uh, if we're going to proceed. As we can see from this meeting, uh, the chair was not able to attend because of another commitment, and uh, Veronique is taking that role. Uh, but a vice chair would normally be the person or somebody who's been asked to convene the meeting. I guess you were asked to convene the meeting. But uh, we did adopt the bylaw at the uh, an amendment to the bylaw at the last meeting that allowed us to uh, to uh, vote for a chair. I guess my issue would be, and we did say at the last meeting we would discuss this at this meeting. Yes. So I uh, want to have a sentiment from the board members of whether we're ready to, vo to vote today on a vice chair, whether we'd like to postpone that, whether there are any other outstanding issues that we would like to deal with today. We've got just a quorum today, so my only caution is if we've got a quorum and there's any debate about the vice chair, we can't uh, elect them. we just got the number for a quorum. So, yeah, I don't have a debate. I just have a sort of a point of information. Uh, so our, our, we have adopted in our bylaws the ability to, we've created this slot of vice chair, yes. even though we haven't identified somebody to fill that. Right. Yeah, okay. Good. And, okay. So uh, uh, I favorite. I think it's something we should do. I'm not sure we're ready to go ahead and vote on it. We just seven. Right, right. Just eight. We've got a quorum, yeah. so it makes it hard to vote. So my suggestion is we do that at the next meeting, unless if somebody else has a stronger opinion. Although, yeah. although we could uh, mm -hmm. select one of the people who's not here. <laughs> As a reward that would not be nice. That would not be nice. Uh, so, but uh, yeah, if we're not being we punished from everybody. But uh, sure. Bernice, there was another dimension of, of bringing this topic up again today. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were reservations, I think, expressed by DDOE staff that um, there was a lack of clarity in just what the function and role was. I think we kind of rolled over that by saying, um, Correct me if I'm wrong. The language I think is something to the effect of anything that wasn't expressly uh, identified or withheld to the chair of the statute would be something subject to the vice chair to to act on or function in, either the statute or the bylaws. Uh, so I was under the impression that there might be some further discussion of how we might want to limit the vice chair at this meeting. Yeah, I uh, but that not. was, I read the minutes and, and based upon the current of my staff, that's the impression that I had, that there was still right. some discussion needed in 
terms of exactly what the responsibility of the <coughs> vice chair would be or what the prohibitions, what activities they could not do and how to capture that language. And that was also one of the questions that I had. I mean, reading the minutes, there was some discussion, and I don't know whether this was a serious statement or not, that the vice chair would not necessarily have to be a member of the advisory board. I don't think that was a serious statement. Okay. But I think, I think well, no, legally, it was, it was legally, legally, it is not required. You know, right. Obviously, I don't think any of us have the intention to do that, but that is legally true. Right. As it is true for the Supreme Court. Right. right. Yes, and just to add to that, I think the discussion was that the vice chair cannot replace the chair. There's certain roles that only the chair can, that's the responsibility. And in the example in the bylaws is the speaking on behalf of the board. That's specifically reserved for the chair. Right. So if we didn't. I, I move that we postpone the vote until the next meeting or some subsequent meeting. Second. I vote on So are we calling the vote? We're calling the vote all of it. All. Sorry. I, I forget the initiative. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah. All in favor. Yeah. All in favor. favor. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. Uh, any abstentions or any objections from the phone particularly? Okay. Oh, who's on the line? She said no. Okay, she said no. I thought it was in. Alright. Someone else on. Um, so now I'm going to apologize for having skipped that part at the DCSU. Actually, I'm sorry. I just had one more. Uh, I'd like to get some resolution to the uh, concern that Sandra and I addressed. If there is any additional concern or reservations, it seems is that the final word on the media we staff? I just want to get clarity. Are there any other expectations that we're going to have additional concerns expressed or language introduced to bylaws to clarify the rule? So. That's it? Uh, I believe we said that the, the act is silent, so the role of mm -hmm. the position of vice chair is from the Okay, so the minutes should show that we've resolved this. Well, well, but I think it's still except for election of the chair, no, election, for vice chair. And there could be further discussion. On the role of the vice chair. On the role of the vice chair. So you would want the so entire board to be discussion. there for that discussion, yeah. right? Okay. So as so that should be noted in the in the minutes that there could be further discussion okay. on the role of the right. vice chair or the prohibition by from the vice chair. Right. Right. I think we have uh, finalized the language. The, the bylaws have been amended. It is what it is. So that's done. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's anything that prohibits us from discussing mm -hmm. that because once we elect a, a vice chair, the vice chair would appreciate knowing yes. what they can do or not do. That's precisely so, my concern. Right. That's why I was trying to get to the point of whether yeah. or not we are going to continue this discussion right. or not. Yes. yes. And so does someone have the responsibility for teeing it up and clarifying things? I just think we put it on the minute. Put it back in the minute. And how hopefully the full board shows up so we can have the discussion because we have so many members of the board who are not here. I don't think there's any more tee up as far as I'm concerned that has to be done. We just want to have the discussion. Uh, DDOE, if there's more things you're going to bring, bring them to us at the next meeting. Okay. Yeah, I, and I, want to add, I think that's very important that, that this not just language for the, for the three months, but the, the DDOE, I don't know if you look at you, but DDOE, you all, I believe, should bring that in and say what. If they can't do it, what well, they can, and then we discuss that. But you can sure we do that uh, before we meet again, right? I think I think uh, then we've done so. We've provided right. our position. I guess you know the, the only unclear part is the role of the vice chair. You know, well, that's what I'm short thinking. of seeing you know what those proposed roles are, then you know it's hard for us to have any uh, comment or position who's, on. Who's coming out with a proposed role? I would think that would be the bylaws committee that would be responsible in defining what the vice chair would be doing. Yeah. And, uh, and the bylaws committee has already made their recommendations right. so and we okay. adopted them in our last meeting. Right. So this is, okay. we can either just next meeting okay. we will vote on the vice chair and that will be the conclusion. Okay. Okay. Sounds, okay. sounds that's like fine. Right. Okay. All right. Good. I may introduce an amendment that the vice chair bring in the <laughs> we will write this as serious or not serious. That's not serious. <laughs> um, not serious. So we're good for the DCSU to come up now. Okay.
I just don't want to keep it close to the phone because if people don't want to come, they don't want to do that. Yeah, no, I understand. Okay, we all. This guy here, too, from all over the world. It's Madam Acting Chair and members of the board, our esteemed clients and members assembled here this morning. Good morning. 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 My name is Ted Tradeview, and I'm the managing director of the DC Sustainable Energy Utility, and I've had the pleasure of holding this job now um, for about ooh, 18 to 20 months. And I'm, I'm really, really proud of a lot of the work that we've done, and I think it was very informative to have our auditors, F.S. Taylor, come in and actually present some of the findings that they have discovered through their work as they reviewed our work. From the inception of the organization in March of 2011 through the end of fiscal year 2012, and as was noted in the FS Taylor report, um, we, we are growing. We're a startup. We're learning. Uh, there are clearly improvements to be made, and um, and we're taking their advice to heart and and making those improvements accordingly with the advice of a, a very good set of professionals who laid a, a nice set of eyes on our operations last year. Just as a frame of reference, we completed about 690 projects, and of those, yes, we did make an incentive miscalculation on one of them. So um, we are working to improve constantly uh, throughout the organization, but uh, hopefully I can stand here next year and say we didn't make any mistakes. I doubt that will be the case at all, but, uh, but, but we're pretty pleased with, with our auditing results of last year. Let me do a quick poll, because I've got a presentation here. I've got two different presentations. I can do about 25 or 30 slides, or I've got another one that's about five slides. I would like to hear what you're proposing for the 2014 budget without, you know, getting right to what you're proposing to do in terms of programmatic. Well, so okay, I sure, sure, so, sure. I mean, um, I and what, then yeah. go back, I mean, the overview, if that doesn't contain, I don't know what the overview is. If it's an overview right. of the budget, no. then... I will, I will, an initiative overview is the overview of the 10, roughly 10 initiatives that we have decided that we will run in FY14. So I can take you through them initiative by initiative. I think we want to see the, that. Pardon me? I think we want to see that. Yes, yes, yeah. I, I want to show that. Right. Absolutely. So we'll take you through the 10 initiatives. Then we'll go through, um, particularly as it relates to gas savings, how we, as you can see in the audit, how we missed that mark last year, how we're going to ramp up in three different areas in an effort to attain that mark in FY14. And then we will um, talk about some different things about how we will be engaging with our contractors in FY14 to hopefully make the process of working with us an easier one. So I'd like to talk about that as well. So what, what, what were you asking us? Whether you want to do 12 the or 15 The long slides or the short slides. What, what was I, was, that I, was, I was really making a, a joke. Oh. <laughs> I think we'd like oh. to see all the slides. You know, we don't, could. Don't we worry. Could really, really, we, really we, we, can, we can do all of this. It's really only about five slides. Okay. But, um, and then it, I'm sure there will be some levels of detail that you guys would like, and we can, uh, we can provide that as well. Are you going to provide us a copy of the slides afterwards? Or? As we always do, I believe. Yeah. You know, yeah. Have you not been received them? How do we, they do this from what I don't we think so. We got them. Yeah. Uh, I think sometimes we get them before the meetings, and sometimes, one time we got them before, which was great. Okay. That gives you a time to study them, and, yeah. and yeah. now we're getting them at the meeting, so yes, I want it after the meeting, but I prefer before the meeting. Sure. Uh, if we could have all of your presentations a couple of days before, because each of us represent entities. We're not individuals per se. Mm -hmm. And so each of us have constituencies that we need to make sure this goes yeah. by. You, you, get, so, you need some internal reviews. Yes, so I, I would appreciate, Absolutely. maybe I could put it to a vote for the body um, and suggest that when the SEU presents that they provide copies of the slides at least three days before an SDC SEU advisory board meeting and I would ask somebody that's a motion to second that motion if there is a second second the, the second is that we are asking for this not that they not that we're demanding it right we're asking for it right 
And, uh, well, but I, I hope it will, if we ask for it, I would hope that they try to give it to us. To the extent that it's within our abilities to do it. Right. Yeah, absolutely and if you will. can't do three days, I mean, I'm right. flexible. Yeah. One day, the point is to have it before. Right. So, so what, is your motion to have it before or three days before? I say, well, what would work for you, Ted? One day, two days, three days? A couple of days is normal. Two, two, two days? I'll say two, two days. days. Okay, okay, so my... And two business days? Yeah, that would help, too. That would help, too. Yeah, help as well, because we didn't get a final agenda for this meeting until, you know, about a couple of days ago as well, so... But, but that's, that's I, I, I think that that's, you know, that's something that we can clearly work out. We can get you um, the size. Now, and, and, Two days. Please, and, please, and please, you know, you know the information changes sometimes. We might make a tweak or so sure, here. So we understand that. Right, right. right. Just, just to get a draft. I mean, so my motion is that the uh, SEU Advisory Board ask the, DD, ask the SEU to provide a draft of any of its proposed presentations to the board members two days in advance of the meeting. The meeting second. Second. All ayes? Aye. Aye. Any Aye. objection? Excuse me, this is Donna. I wanted to offer another amendment um, that is consistent with that as well because it's not only specific to the SEU, for example, if other entities as well that may make presentations, for example, if a PEPCO, Washington Gas, can that be applicable to all entities so that we will at least have that information in advance of those meetings? I won't accept that as a, uh, uh, what is it, a friendly, uh, a friendly amendment. amendment. You can make that motion separately, Donna, but let's, I mean, the SEU is our main business, and then uh, we can come back to your motion. Okay, so we want to go back. I, I want to call the question. A vote on this question that I Are the you motion. Okay? So we're voting on the first motion that was presented by Bernice. All ayes? Uh, Aye. Any objection? Aye. Any exception was spoken for, so we're good. All right. Do we if Donna, do you have a second motion? I do. I would like to make a recommendation, for example, when there are critical pieces of information or presentations that are being made, such as, for example, if PEPCO is to make a presentation or Washington Gas as it relates to the presentation that was made at the last meeting as well, that that information, in, in an attempt to ensure that the board also have access to that information in a timely manner before it's presented, that they endeavor to ultimately present that information within that same timeline as well. So your motion would be that you're asking any um, critical presentation to be available to the board um, two days in advance of board meetings? Exactly. If it's on the agenda and it's to be presented, ultimately, that the entity that is on that agenda be actually asked to present that information at least two days in advance and as well. We, we understand that there might be changes uh, in those two days for whatever reason. Um, so can I ask who's all in favor? Well, well the first has to be a second. Discussion, well, second, sorry. Can I, I just check thought, before? Sorry. Uh, uh, Donna, first use critical, then you drop it. I, okay, you want to Yeah, I drop critical because that's such a subjective type of a, mm -hmm. a phrase, ultimately, and that's why I said information that is posted actually on the agenda to be presented. Yeah. For example, if PEPCO is on the agenda to present information, right. if Washington Gas, if it could be right. a third party contractor, any entity that's on the agenda. So we we'll just take the word critical out. Have that information before the board, at least two days in advance. Of that meeting as well. Great. Thanks, Donna. Any further discussion? Yeah, and, but before that, someone just second. Second. No second, Sandra. Seconding all eyes. Aye. Aye. Any objection? Aye. Any objection? Okay, motion passed. Um, Ted, you may continue. Thank you. <laughs> 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 Thank you very much. The, the first slide that I would like to present here is a snapshot of the programs that are in our uh, in our plan for FY14 for implementation. Let me give a backdrop. As you remember in FY13 when we got started, it was kind of not even ready, set, go. It was just go. 
And so we started with um, three, basically, programs that were called quick starts. We ramped those down in the first quarter of FY12 and came up with um, a, a base uh, set of programs here. There are about 10 of them here, many of them market rate programs. It will really give us the opportunity to penetrate the totality of the markets within the District of Columbia. We also have, at this point, uh, many months of work with many of these programs. So it's not like we're going to take everything down, going into FY14 and ramp up a whole bunch of new programs going, going into FY14. We want to basically take our base programs and make some refinements for them, some of them suggested by F.S. Taylor and others. Um, some of them s suggested by Tetra Tech, who's doing our EM and V work, make some refinements, make some improvements, and really talk about where some of these programs have been excelling in the market and therefore make some budget adjustments. And I'll talk about some of those budget adjustments as I go program by program through these so that you can understand the uptake that some of these programs have had and the struggles that others have had. And we can talk about them individually. Let's start with our residential customers where we do home performance with energy stock. Can, can most of you see this? Okay. The first one up here says home performance. That's the program where we work with contractors here in the city to go into a resident's home and after an audit has been performed, perform energy efficiency work that would possibly include insulation, um, new air conditioners, new heating systems, don't, um, you know, in, in a number of different areas, uh, lighting, of course, is always one of the areas that's examined. Here in this program, what we've been doing is paying the customer an incentive of up to $500 if they performed over $1,500 worth of work and reduce the air leakage in their house by at least 10%. Hello again. change in FY14 in this program is we have found that um, some of this work has, has been a little bit slow on the uptick. If we have looked at incentive levels, this is a, a program that's run in some of our surrounding jurisdictions as well. Raising the incentive level by, by basically doubling it and make, making it more compatible with what our surrounding jurisdictions are offering for a program like this. We've also added a feature where if you have central air conditioning, central heating in your home, if you do a duct sealing job, which allows, of course, reduces the leakage of air out of the ducts, we would pay for up to $500 or half of the cost of that service being performed in your home. So this is a project program that, um, and, and as you can see along this chart on the top, we look at where these programs contribute to the benchmarks that we're trying to achieve as an organization. And you've got reducing per capita energy consumption, of course, on all of these. But, um, and here, you've got another check for reducing peak demand growth, uh, increasing number of green jobs. We use local contractors who are using DC residents. And uh, we use certified business enterprises in this program as well. So this is one of those that contributes in a number of different ways to the benchmarks that we're trying to achieve. Second program here is our federal home uh, loan bank program, which um, is the program for. Ted, can mm -hmm. I ask a question? Um, home performance. How much are you increasing the incentive to? From what to what? From five hundred to a thousand. That basically. Is the and what did you see as the impediment to reaching your goal for FY thirteen? In, in the, the goal in FY13 on this one, um, really, we, we didn't have a lot of residents uh, taking advantage of, of the incentive level. We, we did a little bit of survey, and we felt maybe the incentive was too low. As I said, we looked at surrounding jurisdictions to see what they were offering, uh, which was much higher than what we are currently offering. So we thought that with a little sweetener there, they would, we would get more residents enrolled in the program. Um, and, and I will say internally we've had our struggles as well in terms of getting a good manager in place to manage that program. We had an offer, uh, very sadly, an offer on the street for a very, very highly skilled individual 
and, and he just turned us down on Monday. I was very disappointed in that. That is an internal uh, issue, but, but that is one of our challenges as well. Uh, Ms. Ryan. Ted, I'd also like to offer, um, we've had a challenge around our contractor base because they're not, they're, we've only found 40 subcontractors um, in the district that do that, do that type of work. Uh, so in terms of just the capacity to go out and generate leads, you know, there's been a slow uptake, and I think, and that's, um, that's one thing that we're considering for 13 is opening it up uh, to area contractors who have more experience with the program, uh, although that does kind of go against our CD spend as well. The, uh, the, the second thing I would say is that um, this is kind of a costly program uh, for the consumer. Uh, when you go to them and say, hey, we want to do you know, $4,000 worth of air sealing and, uh, or air reduction and, and duct sealing, that's not something that they can see. And so even the value, them understanding the value proposition, they may feel the comfort uh, in their home, but you know the savings piece, it, it's a hard program to sell. And I think you see that in other jurisdictions as well. Thank you. I, I would say yes. We're, we're not the only jurisdiction struggling with uptake on this program. Contrary to the next program, which is our federal home loan bank program, which is way oversubscribed. This is the program where we've leveraged in up to a million dollars from the federal home loan bank. It's available for residents who are at 60% on an income level, 60% of area median income or less. So this is a, a low income program where the residents, after the banks take a little bit of a, a fee, maybe $700, the residents can get up to $12,000 worth of work done on their home in a, in a what is a five year forgivable loan. So as long as the resident stays in the home, essentially it's a grant. There's no stream of repayment during the five years. This is, of course, very, very popular with a number of residents. And uh, not only is the District of Columbia, but other jurisdictions are competing for this money as well. We completed about 30 homes through this program this year. If you just do the math, $12,000 divided into a million dollars is 82. But clearly, as I said, there were others competing for that money. Unfortunately, this program ran out of money maybe about six weeks ago. And it is very frustrating when you a qualified resident to participate in this program, a contractor has gone out and scoped out the work, and then we get word from the Federal Home Loan Bank that no more funds are available until next January. What we are trying to do, because this, this is where we work with Industrial Bank of Washington, which is one of the members of the Federal Home Loan Banking System, we're trying to find a second uh, bank to work with us. <coughs> Visited a number of them. A lot of these banks don't like to deal with loans that are less than about a quarter of a million dollars. They think it's too much trouble uh, for their for their business operations. Uh, so it's, it's difficult to find a bank to participate with us. But right now, Industrial will be with us next year, and we'll pick this back up in in January. Uh, Ted, yes, ma'am. Uh, for that program, how many people did you have to sort of break your commitment for? How many homes? Well, I would just say we have a waiting list of about 150, 180 people right now. Wow. Waiting list, yeah. So and you were we, able we, to we, we would hope to honor the commitment, but we just can't do, do it now. Right. Right. right, right. And yeah. I think one thing that uh, contributed to that, we just found out that you can only have eight active projects at a time. Yeah, that's, that's another one of the things that the Federal Home Loan Bank changed the rules on us midstream. Because we had, you know, 15 or 20 projects, you know, had submitted them already to the bank, income qualified the residents, got all of the paperwork from the residents, and then the bank said, well, we'll, we'll only process eight loans at a time. Is that Mr. Mizra? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm just suggesting probably the obvious, which is it's only five months till you know, it starts again. <clears throat> I would assume you're going to have a bunch of these in the queue. And just oh, absolutely. Walk in yeah. and but go. what you have to do, there, there, there's a, there are timing issues on this program that are very important. We can't take the income statements from the individuals, what's this, July, and then submit them in January. So we have to take the income statements from the individuals. They have to be within about, I think, 90 days of the date when we submit them to the bank. And we have to have an estimate from the contractor that's also got to be done within 90 days of our submitted information. So there's some critical timing issues here. So, so, so yes, what we'll be doing in November and December is qualifying on sure. an income basis and get the contractors out so that come January 1st we'll be ready to put the first batch in. Unfortunately, we can only put eight in. We've got to wait for those eight to complete. And so we can put the next group of eight in. I mean, you need another 
bank. We need, we need another, another bank, bank to work with us on this. Yeah, need to, yeah. The bank makes it as difficult as possible to do uh, to do this work. Mr. Waterburn, I think you had a question. No, no? I didn't. Okay. Okay. With our retail efficient products, um, this is one of the programs where we're very, very happy to say there's been tremendous uptick in the community. This is the program where we Hopefully you've been into Safeway or Fragers before we had this tragic fire, or um, Rodman's. We have 50 different retailers working with us now. I think I told the board last time we met that Giant Foods had also come on board and they are participating with us now, where we have the CFLs in the stores that are marked down uh, to very, very affordable prices for the residents. In FY12, through our retailers, through our participating retailers, we moved about 45,000 CFLs. So far this year, we have moved almost 200,000 CFLs, so there's been a tremendous amount of uptick in this uh, program. We've also added to this program um, LEDs, LED lighting. I think we had some of the LED lighting here last time, but those are those originally were in this program as a as a on the shelf rebate. You would go and you would fill out a form and you would send it in and get a rebate. Now we've just moved directly to the price on the shelf is marked down. There are no forms to fill out or anything. You get the re you get the reduction uh, automatically. So LED lighting is in here as well. Retail efficient products also expanded this <coughs> one <coughs> next dark, to include several um, rebates on, on gas products. Hot water heaters, um, tankless hot water heaters, furnaces. I might be a little bit ahead of myself here. I was trying to take advantage of this program on Monday as my hot water heater went out my gas. <laughs> oh, no. went out on Sunday morning as my wife woke up saying, where the is the hot water? And, uh, <laughs> still trying to dry the house out right now. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, the, this is uh, one of the things we've expanded. And, and I can't give you any early results as it's only been on the street now for 23 days. So, uh, but next time we meet, I'll be able to tell you what sort of uptick we're getting. <coughs> yeah, I've uh, been involved uh, with, you know, the energy efficiency programs, particularly uh, public awareness, for a reasonably long time now. Probably, I, I don't know if anybody's familiar with the Energy Efficiency Forum that Johnson Controls and the U.S. Energy Association co-host which is in its 24th year now, but uh, and the Alliance to Save Energy and all of these organizations. So the, uh, uh, one of the best tried and true ways to educate the public is to go into the elementary schools and have all the kids get educated and then go and tag their parents about this. So, so you know, I mean, we, we do you, we do this at the DOE. There is a you know, program paid by a separate DOE program on energy patrol. This year we'll also be looking at, okay. you know, how that kind of communication does. It doesn't mean the SEU cannot do it in addition, but they won't get direct, you know, direct results right away. But it, it's something that um, we have to work closely with them, you know, to, right. to, to make sure that at least in the elementary school, the kids know what we're talking about. And then I think, piggy, you know, you piggyback the exact programs on that. Right. So, I mean, again, what I'm, I'm suggesting something that I guess is obvious, but syncing up SEU's rebates mm -hmm. and their their I stock with what you guys are doing yeah. just seems obvious. obvious. Yeah. And so my suggestion is that you ought to consider having a staff or work with their needs people and the people that are doing this to basically say, and oh, by the way, there's this thing called the SEU and we have light bulbs or we have whatever, because that is sort of a, a, uh, a ground up method. Right, right, right. One of the things we have done is we are out at every community uh, association, all of these community <coughs> festivals that we can find. Uh, all over the city. I think we did almost 60 of them last year. I mean, we are geared up. We've already been out doing them. We've expanded this year, in fact, and not just doing the you know, community groups, the Adams Morgan festivals and things like that. We're going around to all the senior centers <laughs> and meeting with the seniors at the centers and telling them about the programs. 
and everything so we can get them involved. Ted, have, well. you, have you tapped into the churches and other yeah. religious oh, yes. institutions? Because those have large yes. numbers. Yeah, yes, absolutely. absolutely. Right. I just wanted to add because we have been working closely, Washington Gas has been working closely with the, the SEU on the gas rebate programs and we have added to our DC customer choice page a link to take uh, uh, customers to the SEU's website and we've uh, put some content <coughs> in on our website along that line. We've also uh, put on our, when people call us for emergency service on our, our, our telephone calls, we have a, some language that's been added in. If you're a DC resident, this program is existing. And in our walk-in offices, we put out some pamphlets that the DC SEU has provided to us to make that information available. Um, right, so and, and, and I thank Bernice and, and her company for working very, very closely with us on that. And, and particularly for this one, what we do is um, we list the contractors, so you don't have to go and try to search for a contractor. We list the contractors on the website who have all of these products that know where they are available, and so the contractor can come to your house and there's no guesswork involved. They show you all the, I had this done this week so I can verify it. <laughs> as expensive as it was. <laughs> um, they, they actually come to your house and they've got all of the products laid out and everything and their brochures and they're very, very good, very professional people. Yes. Ted, Ted is your, does your website show these specifics like, uh, on a, on a, say, a gas rebate, if I had to replace my water heater, I could go there and see that there's a rebate of $50 or what have you. Is that specifically on your website? Yes, yes. yes. Now, and then, now, the water heaters, of course, vary in size. Right. So there are you know, different amounts available, you know, depending upon the size. Right. Okay. It's starting at 50 okay. gallons. It's starting at 50 gallons. Okay. Mr. Cleverton? Um, this is something you may have encountered. Um, how are you working with the suppliers to make sure that there is a good supply of energy that we can see water heaters available immediately for people like you? Uh, in the past, there always has been a problem that Everyone wants to get an energy efficiency water heater, but when their water heater goes out, they purchase one. There's not any available right then. You have to order them, and I don't think your wife's going to like being out without mm -hmm. a water heater for six weeks. Right, right. Now, we, Marcus, you want to talk about how we work the supply chain on this? Because it's, it's very similar to the way when we do um, the T12 lighting programs and everything, of course, and those are all supplied by CBE suppliers here in the District of Columbia. So we work with them up front to say these are the products we're going to be promoting to make sure they have them on stock. We, we can't run these programs without working with the suppliers on the front end as well to make sure that the products are available. And because, as you accurately point out, if you need a hot water heater, you need it today. You don't need it next week. <laughs> you know, so you have to have uh, these products on, on supply. Yeah, they, they are here in the District of Columbia over on Bladensburg Road to be exact. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so to Dan's question, if I can uh, personalize this a little bit, when your hot water heater goes out, who do you call? Do you call a plumber right away? And is it the plumber? Well, the, these the, contractors are, are for these for hot well, water heaters. Yes, they're, they're all plumbers. Well, but, but my point is, yeah. How do you to, hook up? To Dan's point, how do you hook up with these rebates? Does oh, no, we we have all of the suppliers listed on the. I mean, not the suppliers. I'm sorry, the contractors listed on the SEU website. So you have a choice of which one you want to call. All of these contractors. But no, in the no, middle no. of the night, you're not going to call the You're not, you're not going to go to the SEU website. Your website. <laughs> you're going to call well, the plumber. And, and how is the, the information getting to the plumber, and how is he getting that information to, 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 to the potential? You, you go, I need a hot water heater. Right. Uh, Can I try the, to help you right. answer that? Because goes, yeah. we have uh, our, our company has agreed to help at least inform those plumbers that we deal with or that might mm -hmm. contact us to know about the SEU, the mm -hmm. district's basis. I think that this conversation has yeah. happened. So we're trying to, at least I know Washington Gas is trying to make sure that at least the people that might come our way would be a, a, aware of that. And I right. know the and SEU is doing some other stuff. Actually, we're leveraging your list because there's some safety concerns and quality standards around, you know, gas that we don't, you know, we're not in the business of verifying or 
certifying contractors. So we're actually leveraging that list. Now, to the point of working the supply chain, we're pushing the rebates with the supply houses. Right. But Marcus, it's going to be, you know, your, your hot water heater goes out. You, you go to the yellow pages or the internet and you call, call the plumber. And that plumber says, okay, I'll send somebody out. It's the plumber that needs to know, right. hey, you live in the district. Uh, he's, he's, the SEU rebate. is using the Washington Gas Plumbers List. Okay. 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 <laughs> so, so, so you said I, I we're offering you, gas service. In, I can get you this really, you know, good system because of this rebate for a lot less than you would have to pay for it. Yep. Right? So yep. that's what you're doing. Again, so we're working with those those plumbers. So. Again, we're not going out and certifying our own because of the so, so Ted's wife is not only going to say you're my hero because you, I have hot water, but you saved us a lot of money too. Take a lot more for her to say that. Okay. 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 I, I'm sorry. Ted. I, just, I just wanted to likewise add to um, uh, Bernice's comment. OPC, when we go out to our various community meetings, uh, particularly. Uh, Pam, she also talks about the SEU and the connection and gives them a reference to the SEU. So the word is getting out, and you know, the parties are doing their part in terms of exploring, expanding the, um, you know, the information base. And then another critical piece here, even if a customer finds out about the rebate after the fact, let's say you didn't hear about it until September, for as long as it's within that window, program launched July 1st, installed between July 1st and September 30th, you will still get the rebate. You know, you just need to fill out the paperwork. Yes, you will verify the installation. So you don't that's necessarily good. have that's to have that helpful. information up front, but, you know, you hear about that's it after good. the fact, you can still take advantage of it. That's excellent. Well, I'm, I'm glad you said that because I bought a nice uh, <laughs> <laughs> a few months ago. I hope it's within this time frame. That we, we only launched on July 1st. I, I bought my daughter um, a uh, really nice uh, washing machine, and I remember when I bought it at Sears, it had something on it. I didn't pay a lot of it. It said rebate. Well, when it was installed in my daughter's house, you know, she not knowing anything about rebates, uh, I'm, I'm sure she just tore it off and tossed it. But I could contact you guys and right. we, we, had, we have rebates on the, uh, the clothes washers and the refrigerators that went back almost to the beginning of the fiscal year that, that are within this program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you can... Yeah, and we actually did, we've right? done in-store promotions yeah. at Sears. So I would say we could just take a look at the model number and see if it's all... That's okay. You're encouraging free riders. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, Efficient products at the food banks, and, and this is a, a program that's designed specifically to distribute our, our CFLs to residents who cannot get out uh, of their homes. So this is where we've distributed CFLs directly through the food bank distribution network. Uh, we've got that ramped up and going again this year. Ted, how many bulbs have you distributed? And how many through, how many bulbs is program? each person? Yes, through that program. I know you said This program, 000. only about 40,000 this year. And so, how many bulbs does each person get? One? Twelve. Twelve? Up to twelve. Up to up to house yeah. Is there any follow-up education? Because I have a concern with that program because I'm not certain that people, you know, you're targeting low-income people. Do they get any information on how to use this, how to value? Yeah, that, um, that's, that's put in the distribution kits when they get it. And are you getting feedback in terms of how... I mean, are you served? How are you assessing the benefit or the savings? How do you know whether or not it goes in the closet or it goes into the right, right, right. Yeah. Sock? Tet Tetra Tech clearly does that work. You know, has an in-service analysis. We don't make the assumption that 100% of these are installed immediately. People normally install bulbs as the <laughs> other one burns out. So yeah, they, they do that analysis mm -hmm. uh, and they come up with those assumptions. But yeah, yeah clearly I couldn't say if I distributed six bulbs today that you would put all of them in today and take a working bulb out. Mm -hmm. And we can say that at the energy centers where, you know, we provide light heat, um, 
the low income folks often have training there either by a video or by a person on different energy efficiency so that kind of complements what they do um, which is good you know a lot of the same target population know already so someone that's talking going about to the food bank would likely have had this type mm -hmm. of training in some of the yeah, aspects it's of the program. absolutely possible that because I think that that's important the I think that the education component of that particular program is critical to success otherwise you know I just have this vision of it being in the closet <coughs> somewhere um, um, this is Diane can, can I I'm sorry catching up can I just ask you one question about the appliance rebate program yes yeah, okay, because um, I'm, I'm a little confused. I just went on your website. Um, the washing machine and the, 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 the clothes washer rebate, do you have to buy that through a licensed contractor to get the rebate? No, no, no. You can buy that. No, okay. No, it, it, you know, the, because the contractors aren't going to sell you the washing machines and refrigerators. You'll buy those at... Best Buy, Lowe's, right. Home Depot. You'll go to Best Buy, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then on the water heater, how does that work? Yes, that one, I believe, you got to buy through a certified contract. You have to go, to, and then I look on your website, and there's on the plumbing, um, and, and there are seven plumbing contractors listed. Only one of them is in the district. I know. So those are the only ones you could use to get the water heater rebate. Is that, is that what you're saying? I'm sorry, I didn't. Let me, let me get closer to it. Okay. If I go on the, on the, the only let's say I am on the, the market for a water heater. Um, that's a good one. Should I go on the end one? So I, and that obviously tells you you have to have a plumber for you can't. Go out and look that up yourself. Right, you can see with, um, with, with the with the water heater, you, you, you could look up yourself. So, so I go on the website. Well, and so with, the hot water, with the hot water heater, you're still going to have to pull a permit, and and there has to the, the city has the option of inspecting that work, and that, that's why we want to make right, sure. Right, no, I understand that. Mm -hmm. I understand that. So you have to get a plumber. So I said, go on my plumber. I go on your website. There are seven um, seven plumbing contractors listed. So, first of all, those are the only ones you could use in order to get the rebate for a new water heater. Is right. that correct? That, those are the only ones that we have right now, and I know that Magnolia is the only okay. one that's listed in there that's the DC. Right. And uh, only uh, one of those seven mm -hmm. is in the district. Right, that's Magnolia. Mm -hmm. we're, but, and yeah, believe me, Magnolia. Chairman Kay, we're working to expand that network. But, but we wanted to get this program up and going as quickly as possible so that these are the groups, uh, contractors we're working with right now. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, Ted, I guess the implicit question is, why is it not oh, possible and what, and to extend this to... What is the dollar amount rebate for water heater? It's at least $150. Yeah. yeah. Because a, a that, um, on-demand gas water heater is several thousand. Right, so, so the, the, le yeah. the smallest rebate was $150. And on some of the gas products, okay. the rebates are as high as eight hundred, up to seven hundred dollars. Yeah. So, so I guess the implicit question is, why can't this be engineered? Why can't this program be designed so that um, any plumber carrying an energy efficient water heater could install it, and then the customer could get a rebate? Is there is there an obstacle to doing it that way? I something we can clearly take a look at. Because, uh, I mean, the questions that I've heard over the last few minutes have really kind of revolved around, you know, people don't go to the SU website when they think about getting a water heater, necessarily. Right. <laughs> some of us might. And so, and some of us may have established plumbers that we've been working with forever, especially property management companies. Um, why wouldn't we just be able to get this into a, uh, into a pipeline where anybody could, could essentially get an energy efficient water heater through their respective plumber and get a get a rebate. Right. Let me um, make sure that we review that question internally and get back to you. Yeah, I, mean, I, think, I think I think it's a fair question. Good.
In fact, this is Donna Alumna's line, and I would assume that it comes through the regulatory division, consumer and regulatory affairs as it relates to licensed plumbers, et cetera. Maybe, maybe there's a way that you can work with Nicholas with a jet and sharing some of this information and getting that information into the pipeline with those individuals as well. Sure. But, but I want to make, there's an important point here. The plumbers don't have these uh, uh, water heaters. They go out and uh, and purchase them from a supplier mm -hmm. of these things. And sometimes right. it could be Home Depot. So it's not really the plumbers. Uh, it's uh, I don't, I'm not saying it's the man. So Home, Home Depot has the uh, on demand and the on demand water. As the but you still have to have a plumber to install them. Yes, heaters. the on-demand water heaters, but you still have to have a plumber to install them. Right, but the uh, but it's not a matter of notifying the plumbers. I don't think it's a matter of notifying Home Depot and other suppliers of the yeah. water heaters. Isn't that that's what we're really? But, but Dan, my point is ultimately as it relates to directing, if you have an arrangement with Home Depot or other places like that, some way of directing them to the places in which those relationships actually exist so that they are purchasing from those particular entities versus others so that that customer cannot get that type of discount. Okay. All right. next program is um, mm -hmm. our low-income multifamily comprehensive program, which is a program where we work with uh, low-income multifamily builders as they are designing their buildings. And so we will continue doing this work in FY14, designing and energy efficiency measures <coughs> as the programs are, are, are being designed and built. Um, a little bit of a difference here with a low-income direct installation. This is a program where we go unit by unit and go into the buildings and, and install unit by unit lighting products, um, wrapping up electric <coughs> hot water heaters, not gas hot water heaters. In the exposed pipe, we would wrap up um, low-flow faucet aerators and low-flow shower heads. A, a big change in our programming, this is a program that we ran in the beginning of FY13, the beginning again, the current year, ramped it down. We will ramp it back up and run it again at the end of FY13, up, down. Um, we will run this more than likely through the entirety of FY14 for a couple of reasons. Primarily, though, uh, as, as F.S. Taylor talked about in the uh, arena of certified business enterprises and our goals around hitting our targets for, for our CBE spend, from this point backwards in our contract, our goal has been to spend 50% of our implementing contract dollars, 50% of the implementing contract dollars with certified business enterprises. Let me give you a rough, some rough math. What that equates to is if we spent $7 million with implementing contractors, 50% of that, or $3.5 million, would have to be spent if we spent $7 million with implementing contractors of any type. 50% of that would have to be spent with certified business enterprises. You saw the results of FS Taylor that we hit that mark last year. So that's about $3.5 million. Moving into FY14, we will be subject to the city's essential requirements of, say, 35% of the entire dollar contract of the entire value of our contract has to be spent with certified business enterprises. So you're moving from a number of this year where we'll spend about $7 million with CBEs to a number next year of 35% of our entire contract, 35% of $20 million is roughly $7 million. You can see how we our, our CBE goal roughly doubles between FY13 and FY14. And, that's, and this is one of those programs where we use all certified business enterprises to do this work. We'll be running this work. This also helps us on our low income spend. We get a lot of DC residents hired through doing this work. And so we'll be running this program throughout the entirety of FY14. And so a question about that. The, um, direct installation, I always read, is meeting 100% uh, SCU 
That's correct. Payment. Yeah, these are these are low income buildings right. exclusively. Okay. Really do this work. And it's great that it's a CBE check mark. What's the difference between the multifamily comprehensive and the direct install in terms of using CBEs? Why don't we use CBEs for the multifamily comprehensive? In the multifamily comprehensive, you're designing HVAC systems. You're des designing whole building systems, mm -hmm. um, boilers and things of the like, where we will incentivize a portion of the work that we will mm -hmm. be doing. Right. We don't pay 100% for it. Right, right. We might pay 10%. We might yeah, pay well, I'm not, actually, we'll my question is not concerning the cost. Pardon it's, me? Why don't we have CBEs? Involved. We don't, we hire, don't have we anybody. We don't hire the contractors to do yeah. this work. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. We're not hired. Okay. For this one. Right. Did, did you deliver the this presentation to some of the members of the boards and not others? I'm I'm looking electronically. It for does the, have the. Uh, uh, what I have I is the FY 2014 annual plan. This, this was is a chart that. The short version. Right. The short version. Right, yeah. Right, right. From June, right? You, you've seen oh, a variation so chart a, before. Mm -hmm. Okay. It doesn't include those. Mine doesn't include that graph. So this is from the last. I'm just trying to find right, right, my right. PDA, remember, remember, the remember. presentation. When, that, when, we, when we met last month and we asked you guys a series of questions around a number of these initiatives, we took that information that you gave us, we took that feedback to help us make our decisions as we would go in FY14. So, yes, you, you've seen... This is updated. This, this is updated. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Based upon the feedback that we got. From so we haven't gotten these no. this yet. No. no. Not not if it was recently delivered. No, no, no. This, this has not been delivered to you within the last less. couple of days. Right. This is something that when did we need in, in June? In June. Whenever we last heard. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. 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 This list is. New. So I'm assuming we'll get this also. Yeah, here we go. Here we go. Okay. Um, okay. We went through that. Um, CNI Technical Assurance Services, which is basically our CNI. Hey, um, Crack and Hendricks jumping on. Um, Brett, can, oh, hey, Crack and Hendricks, okay. From Pace? Yes, from uh, Washington, D.C. to Pace okay. Commercial Program. Okay. I'm, at, I'm based at Urban Energy Advisors. I actually have uh, sat down with uh, some of the folks from, the, from, the, um, from your team at our office of the you're, you're talking, you are at the SEU Advisory Board meeting. You're aware of that? Is that the meeting uh, you're calling into? No, I was given this number by, uh, I was given this number by, um, you are the wrong uh, number. Yeah, today's good. It set this out for a meeting with the okay. plan. Can you, out the wrong phone. Yeah, could you get back to Dave and, and find the right number? Thank you. you. You may get a couple other phone calls. Sorry for the disturbance. Okay, nice good. Nice to hear your voice, Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye. <laughs> Actually, Larry, one thing to follow on about the uh, CBU requirement is we have to do more direct spending with CBUs. Um, it's going to, uh, from an energy saving standpoint, it's going to lower the yields on the projects that we do. Um, a, because we're fully funding them, but also there are lower uh, energy saving measures, like light bulbs, aerators, things like that. So that, that is one impact that I think is pretty important to show up to uh, the um, Yeah, I think it's an issue that deserves more attention. Uh, it, it comes back to the whole issue of we have a competing goals for the SEU. Um, the principal reason the SEU was set up was to conserve energy in the district. We want to create green jobs where we can. If we are looking at uh, a 5 percent shavings of energy savings because we're moving to direct installs so we can get CBEs as opposed to giving incentives to um, you know, projects that hire their own people. We need to do the math on that and decide if that's what we want to do. Yeah. One thing I just would caution us, I'm just looking at the time. We yes. want to get to the DC SEU contract amendment. Yes. And the meeting ends at? At noon. At noon, mm -hmm. so that, and that's 20 minutes, so. Mm -hmm. you, so I'll, are you I'll, good I'll, with I'll, another? I'll take, I'll take your, uh, mm -hmm. your, your cue very quickly, okay. CNI basically remains the same as it was last year. We talked about breaking out and doing a little bit of segmentation of the market and trying to hit some of those buildings that did not do so well in the energy benchmarking that we will be targeting. 
some of those in FY14. That's the only big difference there. Uh, business energy rebates will continue into FY14. The bigger difference there is basically tripling the budget. This is a, a very, very effective program for small and medium-sized businesses uh, to take advantage of some of the rebates on products that they typically use in their facilities. Um, so the, you see a big uptick there. T12 replacement lighting will remain the same with the 70-30 split between we pay 70% and 30% comes from the customer base there. Uh, you'll see that. Um, and, and our solar hot water and solar PV programs basically remain the same uh, as we've been running them in FY14. There, there are no bigger changes there as well. I think the only thing that we had some discussion around last time we met that you know, we, we put on the table but we won't be able to go forward with it is the O Power initiative uh, for gas and, and for electric customers here at the District of Columbia. And that was the decision that uh, was made with a lot of consultation. I know that the people from O Power spoke with the Public Service Commission about it. I think you know, we cleared up all of those issues. Um, we spoke with our uh, EM&B consultants. We also took a look at our CBE spend and the new requirements going into next year um, and felt that this was not something we could fit into our program in FY14, but I think those are the only major changes that you'll see from FY13 going into FY14. And Lance helped me uh, correct a misstatement that I made a couple of minutes ago, because uh, he looked at the, the forms that we have for the rebates on the gas products. You can get them installed by any contractor who is licensed to perform work in the District of Columbia. You don't have to use that list of about seven or so that we have on our website. And, and as long as, so you can, you can deal with your favorite plumber or, or Dan, you know, Yours was a washing machine in your case, but yeah, the, the, this, this is available to all plumbers, but we do have seven listed um, on our website. I'd like to make one, one remark for the uh, for the minutes. Uh, I, I was looking forward to a, an no power uh, pilot in the district. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been demonstrated to make some difference in consumer behavior. Uh, I understand that you've made a decision. Um, I'd like to understand that better. I don't think we have time to take it up today, but um, I would certainly like to explore this further because I'd hate to see it just scratched off the list of potential projects because of some reasoning I don't fully understand. I, but I, 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 and, and I we don't when, have time when to get we, into it. When now. we looked at um, O Pilot, we sat down with, with these gentlemen here who are, who are from O Power, we sat down with them several times. Uh, this is a program that's used by, I want to say, 80 other utilities throughout the United States. Um, I mean, it, it is clearly a very widely accepted program. We didn't, you know, uh, take this situation lightly at all. Mm -hmm. But we have to look at the contractual goals and requirements that we have to meet. I fully appreciate that. For that's us what to I want to pilot, understand better. In order for us to do a pilot, which was estimated to be about $750,000, and there may have been some indirect cost on top of that, I would essentially have to take two of these programs off the table. Yeah, I, I, I understand. I understand that you that you degree of math. The I understand that degree of math. What I don't the, what I don't know is the relative efficiency and and say reduction per capita consumption that might have resulted from that program versus the two programs you'd have to take off the table. And so that that's what I'd like right. to have a better handle on at some okay. point. Maybe put it on the agenda for our next meeting. Um, Ted, isn't your budget going up every year now? Yeah. Not, a, not after this year, no. Mm -hmm. We're excited to play money. And then if we start using less energy, it will... Right, but, but we've gone from 14 to 20. Is that right? I mean, roughly? Or Whatever the start point was to 20. Yeah, the start point was about 12 or 13 million, and then it you was seven and a half. Seven and a half. Yeah. yeah, they actually gave us about uh, six million dollars more in projected program than they could pay for. Is is one of your main okay. calculations for this budget the, the citywide requirement on CDs, which which basically far exceeds the original contract requirement? Yes, clearly I have to factor that in. So, so that's like a driving force beyond yeah, not the original contract. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what I was saying. That that difference right. between 50 percent of no, no. implemented <laughs> contract spend and 35 percent of the entire contract, which is doubled. 
So that's beyond, yeah. but that's maybe beyond your control or, or even yeah. GDOE's there's a dis there's two discussions going on and I think it would be helpful if the person in the audience could be heard because he's answering your question. Go ahead, sorry. Okay, okay. no, no, we, we were just, we're, we're, we're finished. No, so I, I, no, no, I, I want to make this point. The, the, the C CBE requirements have doubled um, from 2013 to 2014 because of, the, um, of a mayor or council citywide requirement on CBE spending on contracts, and it doesn't, it's really not about this base contract, it's about a city-wide requirement that it's double CBE spending, okay. so the game has changed. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, yeah actually, we got I just want to make sure that we get to at least the amendment to right, the yes, contract, because I think this will be important for the board to, right. to hear what is done and where that's going. Okay. No, I will make one last point, you can go to the next slide. I will get there. Um, because we talked about the gas products already, so keep, keep going. Um, the, the last one is our, our new streamlined RFQ process. We will qualify contractors twice a year, all of our contractors for FY14, be they working with us now or people who want to work with us in the future. We'll be requalified. We'll have a contractor meeting next month in August to get everybody together rather than issue an RFP every time we're doing something new. We'll qualify contractors twice a year. This will make it easier to work with us and. Uh, and create a lot less hassles uh, out in the community. That's the only really big point I wanted to make here. The website you'll see we launched in October. And, um, and we're doing some different things as it relates to uh, fellowships uh, for, for workers and, and some helping some district residents get jobs directly with contractors uh, and, and providing some help along those lines as well. That's, that's really all I had to say this morning. I'm sorry if I went over time, but I yeah. appreciate you giving me this time to go through our, our programming for FY14. Okay. Thanks, Thank Thanks. you very much. Yes. Chairman, I was wondering if it would be appropriate now to briefly address the topic since uh, we're here for I, the power. You know, I, I, I think people have said that we want to find a time for that, sure. but it's not on the agenda to discuss um, okay. behavioral change specifically. Okay. So I, I actually, it's, um, I think first we absolutely need to make sure that, um, that we hear about the recent contract amendments that have been done for this year, and, and Lance will you know, talk also about the benchmark, benchmark consultant. Thank so, you. Lance, the floor is yours. Um, well, thank you. And uh, we were kind of torn between doing a PowerPoint presentation or just passing out copies of the contract amendment as is. And I think we opted to go with just passing the amendments out as is. Um, the difficulty here is having the contract in front of you to reference some of these amendments. Most of them are boilerplate amendments that are necessary as we go from one contract year to the next. Stuff like changing the cost reimbursement ceiling and making sure that we have the correct incentives amount associated with the uh, benchmarks that are required for each year. Um, but to this particular amendment that we just completed, the two things I would like to highlight that are of importance here to the board. One, we had had some discussions about eliminating the so-called hockey stick spending that the SEU encountered, you know, in FY11. So we discussed with the SEU and we came to an agreement whereby the SEU would have to expend at least 35% of their budget within the first six months of operation. Um, for this fiscal year that we're in, in FY13, I think at least 43% of the budget was expended in the first six months. So we're well on our way to eliminating that hockey stick spending, so to speak. As we speak today, you know, we're at about 65% of the budget spent as of June 2013, which means between July, August, and sorry, July, August, and September, the SEU will have to get through the other 35% of their budget. Now they have, you know, provided some assurances with the pipelines and with the projects that are rolling that they certainly will be able to spend the remaining budget that they have. In fact, their pipeline far exceeds the available dollars that they have to spend for this year. Um, the second thing of importance to note in the amendments before you, most of the benchmarks, um, when I say most, I'm talking five of them, did not have a penalty scheme explicitly defined in the contract. 
when we set up the benchmarks, we had, had discussions about the penalty scheme, but we kind of stopped it imposing a penalty only for the green job benchmark that was applicable for fiscal year 2013. DOE has since worked with the council um, from the time of startup to obtain the discretion of being able to impose penalties for failure to achieve the required benchmarks. So we took a look at each of those benchmarks, and I'm talking about the benchmark for reducing per capita consumption, uh, benchmark for meeting reductions in peak demand, the benchmark for low income spending, and even a benchmark for renewable. And we designed a penalty scheme that is comparable to the incentive scheme. Uh, as some of you may be familiar, the per capita reduction in consumption. The SEU will receive an incentive if they meet at least the 50% mark, and then it's on a sliding scale for any accomplishment beyond that 50% of that 1% savings for electric or gas. What we did, the penalty scheme will kind of kick in if they fail to meet that 40% mark, so to speak. We didn't want to have a less than 50% mark being so strict whereby you can receive a penalty at 50% and a, uh, an incentive at 50%. So there's a small amount of flexibility in when the penalty will actually kick in. But the important thing to understand is that this is truly at the discretion of DDOE. Of course, the board will put forward its recommendation and advice as to whether you know, we should or should not impose a penalty, but DDOE would make that ultimate decision. I think one of the things that we all need to keep in mind in looking at the penalty scheme is that we can't take a cut and dry method to imposing penalty. We have to look at the entire operations in the totality and fully understand what are some of the limitations uh, the SEU face that may have contributed to them not meeting a particular benchmark. Take, for example, again, the per capita consumption benchmark. Um, part of what we're doing, and you know, it will come up in the second discussion we have, is taking a look at updating those benchmarks, where we're going to reevaluate the benchmarks again to make sure that they are accurately set based on the amount of funds uh, the SEU is receiving based on the other pieces in the contract, such as the CBE spending and the green jobs requirement, to make sure that we're setting attainable benchmarks. So if at any point the SEU did not reach a particular mark, we have to hold them responsible only if, you know, there were actions that are solely at their control and they didn't implement the necessary steps or implement the right programs to achieve those savings. So the penalty scheme um, would be something much harder for us to figure out as to whether we apply a penalty versus the incentive scheme where we can uh, do an evaluation to determine if they made those marks. The penalty will be much a broader discussion, and I'm sure board members will love to weigh in at the end of the year as to whether or not a penalty should be imposed. It would be helpful, I mean, I think you've discussed it somewhat now, um, to understand, you know, what would be the criteria by which you would exercise this discretion so that it's not, you know, sort of an arbitrary type of a, a finding. I um, mean, I, I, you know, would think, you know, I'm thinking as I'm speaking, you know, that you would have a written criteria, but I, I assume that maybe conversation or communication, we would have an understanding of what you're looking at and how you're, you know, again, you know, what you're applying as, a, as the criteria to making that determination particularly where you get a recommendation from the advisory board that a penalty should be imposed, mm -hmm. it would be very, very important that we understand if you reject it, why you rejected it. Certainly, and, and we will develop that criteria as we move along. Um, which brings me to my second piece of the discussion here. Uh, the board and even DCSU and DDOE for quite some time have been talking about the benchmarks and where they are currently set. DDOE has retained the services of Jerome Page and Associates, um, some of the consultants that helped us set the benchmark in the first place, to do an independent review and analysis of the DCSU benchmark and to really suggest any possible updates to the current benchmarks. I think one of the biggest things to focus on when we started in 2009 and 2010 in setting these benchmarks we didn't have a clear idea of how the funds would be coming from the various utilities to make up the dollars that are in the contract. Take, for example, right now we're operating on a, a so-called 80-20 split, where 80% of the funds is coming from the electric company and 20% is coming from the gas company, which really then factors into 
can we have two separate benchmarks for per capita saving or should we bring that to one benchmark whereby it can be attained? Because if we continually set benchmarks that are above and beyond, then it kind of gives the public the impression that the SEU is consistently underperforming. So we need to make sure that we're factoring all those things into the equation. And we have new baseline data that will be used in this analysis. So Jerome Page and Associates have a six-week time frame to really do their analysis and review of the benchmark. And I certainly encourage the board and any other members on the board who have developed various position papers or ideas as to what they think, you know, benchmark should be in a reasonable mark to send us those so we can have the consultants, you know, take all of that into review. Ultimately, the benchmark would be determined by DDOE in a mutual agreement with the DCSU because the contract kind of calls for us to mutually agree to the benchmarks. If we reach a stage where we can't mutually agree on what the benchmark is and DDOE and the board and everyone feels that it should be at a particular level, then we may go into a different situation of having to... May, may I mention something mm -hmm. is that the role of the consultant will be to tell us what those benchmarks should be. However, the negotiation for the next year, you know, let's say they come up with a benchmark that's here, and right now it's here, it's possible that we only negotiate for the next year somewhere here, but we know that to reach the goal that we have for this, you, we should really be able to negotiate all the way up. So that's, that's just, you know, food for thoughts for people. Well, first, yeah. I, mean, I think take I, a while I think to get there. Let me just say, uh, may I suggest yeah. that you have Jerome Page reach out to the board yeah. and have those of the board that have some input offered as opposed to finding our way through the maze and hoping right. it gets there. Right. I think so. that that's, I would support that. I think if it's six weeks, the first question is six weeks from when? When does their contract end? The contract began last Friday. So the six weeks would be? Puts us roughly around the end of August uh, to have their uh, results and their report back to us. And you're anticipating that based on that results, you're going to put something in this FY14 contract? Yes. Okay. So I agree that there's, it's important for the board to have an opportunity before that six weeks is up, before they go to you, to at least hear what they're recommending or have an opportunity to give input. Unfortunately, that means <laughs> another meeting to, to do that. I mean, you know, one thing is to get comments through, but I think if, if the board is interested, I guess it's a board decision, not mine, uh, whether we need to meet again to to have input into the consultant. I think you recognize, I guess, ultimately, DDOE recognizes that a penalty on the incentive is limited to the amount of the incentive. It does not impact the full contract amount. I forget what that incentive was, but it's not maybe significant from SEU's point of view, but it's not as significant as most of the ratepayers' dollars that are being expended. So it is important to address this concern, and so I appreciate the fact that you're going to do it. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering if you, is there some way we can have a meeting or something where we can formally do it, or have a discussion that at least informs uh, the consultant and DOE on the board on this issue? Um, I, I would say yes, because in their contract, they are fully aware that they will have to brief the board on their findings. Um, now, within this process, there will be three reports, so to speak. The first report is what we call a reasonableness assessment of the current benchmarks, where they will go through, you know, various reports, including the m v report, um, uh, certain other privileged communications that we've had with the DCSEU, and a number of other uh, uh, documents out there to make that determination, then they'll provide that as a report. The second step is really getting into the adjustment of the benchmarks. And I think uh, the method that we used the first time around was very successful where we had the consultant present, you know, their position on each of the benchmark and we had opportunity to comment on, on what we think uh, they should be and how to refine those benchmarks. Um, my statement earlier was really for anything that we have currently available that they can use as part of their consideration as they're helping to form, you know, their position, you know, to do their research let them have that information up front instead of when they get to us with a draft report, then okay. we give them that information. All right, so send any information, the board members could send any information to, to Lance. Yes. To, to Lance. 
uh, in advance, and then we're going to schedule a meeting sometime for Jerome Page and Associates to brief the board. Yes, and, and we can, as I said, with the other two, so we could either go through that as we review the interim report, so we could have a full briefing at the end, maybe sometime in September, where they present, you know, their ideas on what they thought about the current benchmarks and where we should be um, setting the new benchmarks. So yeah. I really leave that decision up to the board to determine how involved they, you know, think they need to be in the process. So Liz, well, when are you going to use this information to revise the, uh, the next contract? When, when do you essentially start your writing process to incorporate whatever final decisions you're making <coughs> on, on benchmarks? We will, as we speak right now, we're engaging the SEU in various contract amendments that are outside of the benchmarks. Once we have our positions clearly defined, DDOE's position, the consultant's report, then we'll get back to the table with DCSEU to determine what can be reasonably imposed to start the fiscal year. If there are the benchmarks that need to be imposed after the start of the fiscal year, it would just result in another amendment to FY14 contract. But we're trying to get as much as possible in by October 1, but if we can't get it in by October 1, we'll amend the contract thereafter to make sure that their benchmarks are updated. So a, a meeting with the board in early September would have the ability to influence your decision on the final contract before that October 1 date. Um, or is it better to meet in August? I'm trying to figure out when yeah, is the best fine. time to, discussion. yeah, when's the best time for us to have input? Yeah, in September would be fine, yeah. Because you, you, don't forget that you can't, the way that we just amended this contract, which by the way has been in the pipeline for months, you know, because we recognized last year, for example, the hockey stick, you know, so this was like, um, we are able to do it at any time. Um, so we just want to make sure board members recognize this. What Lance is saying is even preliminary reports that they have will inform us to negotiate whatever is done in August or September. The board will get a fuller report, you know, probably more in depth, including any things that you've sent to Lance or any direct contact that they will have with you um, if they do it in September. That's kind of my quick, you know, a, a same opinion than Lance on that. However, um, we, we do need to make sure, and, and we have talked to them during our kickoff meeting, that they reach out to board members as well. Um, don't forget, they're in the, you know, they are independent. This is like, we want this to be very independent. Everybody can give their opinion, but it's, in, you know, we're trying to make it very independent. So, I, you know, the board can decide if that's better each board member or as a group initially. I'm not sure, you know, but it might be that you want to meet them one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, that's, that's right, and, and that's uh, that's not precluded. We could exactly. all meet with them, but I think the that, light, you know, but for the meeting, for the, a group meeting is for that. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can all send in separate comments, etc. But okay. I think a, a group meeting is helpful, and if September will work, I mean, in other words, we don't want to give input and it be frivolous or not helpful right. because you've already made all the decisions. That's all I'm trying to I, I figure out. I think it's out. a good point. So, you know, we want to see what the board is comfortable with. If people want to hear something before that's more preliminary in August and again in September, I mean, you know, I guess we would have to be, we have to I be I think it would that. be most helpful to get something preliminary so that we could all engage in some of the questions that you might have. I mean, in an advisory capacity, our, our work is most I think useful if you get it before you are halfway to making, or when you're about halfway to getting your decision made, not after you've made your decision. True. Right, exactly. yeah. would, um, would that need to be, Lance, a full board meeting, or could it be more of a meeting? You know. Well, you're not necessarily a meeting. We can send the draft out to the board and, and solicit the comments. You know, That's via the track changes. You know, and members can you know add their two cents in the process. I think when we get to a, a meeting of the whole is when we really you know get to the final results and uh, more or less start to talk about what direction we're heading in for FY14 as to where the marks will be. But we don't need to have a full board meeting to more or less review a, a draft report. You know. Folks can comment and, and send those comments back to us. We get them back to the consultants, and we keep the process, uh, you know, developing in that manner. Yeah, and I mean, those are two separate things. I mean, I was not thinking about reviewing a draft report of a consultant. I was thinking more of giving the consultant ideas 
or our perspective on issues. And uh, advising them, not necessarily reviewing the whatever they give you, but having input in developing that draft. If you say you're getting a draft, I think you said something about an August draft. That's mm -hmm. why I first. In six weeks, right. In six weeks, you're getting a draft. No, in six weeks, we'll be having the final report. The yeah. final report. Oh, well, then definitely we want to meet before the final report is given so, to you. So, so I would think. Right. So can I, let me <laughs> suggest something sort of based on the conversation, uh, which is one, uh, I think it would be very useful for the board or those members, I suspect there'll be uh, several that would like to have input at the very beginning of the process. I suspect Bernice and Donna, maybe Sandra and others who've worked on this uh, would like to at least proffer some issues, you know, that that this consultants ought to be considering. Uh, so that's one step, perhaps. And then the, another step, which you've suggested, which I think is a good idea, is once there's a draft in the works that the advisory board would love to, as a whole, would love to see that able to respond to before any decisions are made. I have to say I do have a different take on this. Sure. Um, I think as I think as um, Lance pointed out sorry about that. Your phone is yeah, I'm playing with it. It's out of control. Uh, as Lance suggested it's a it's an independent contractor um, an independent contractor's perspective and and that's I think reasonable. There's no, no harm in getting independent contractor's perspective. We can provide some input into it. That's fine. I think it's um, more critical that when DDOE begins to evaluate this, this report, we have the opportunity then to engage with DDOE and the SEO perhaps on what is being recommended. So I, I really am in favor of having a meeting at some point before you guys are too far along in making your decisions to talk about the report and say, well, you know, this makes sense. This, this, I think, conflicts with, you know, the whole idea. Just kind of massage the information and discuss it. I think that's going to be our best opportunity to advise DDOE once we have the information in hand. Revising the contractor's report, it's just an opinion there. It's just written opinions. It's, it's when we have the opportunity to discuss these opinions together that I think we're going to be in our, our, our best capacity to advise. So, so let me let me uh, let me state this: the first report that we'll receive is more or less an evaluation of the current benchmarks. That's the reason that we're study. That's scheduled for 30 days from Friday. I think at any point after then we can have this meeting that you're suggesting. At least by then we'll have their independent opinion, one way or the other, as to whether these benchmarks are reasonable or not. Then we can start thinking about how do we go along, go about adjusting them. Right. So at least let's have that opinion, independent opinion on whether or not these benchmarks are reasonable and need adjustment. Because, you know, you can agree that all of us at the table here have various <coughs> opinions as to whether we think they are reasonable or not. So let's hear what the consultants have to say, and then we can, you know, begin to talk about how we move forward. So that's talking about a meeting in August about the week of the 19th is... is after that three-week period is gone, and there's a week or so after that. Is that or August Well, it will be later August, 26th? because last Friday was the, what, 22nd? Um, no, 22nd was Monday, the 19th. The 19th, I'm sorry. The 19th. So it puts us the week of the, uh, maybe the 25th of August. August. So anyway, between that. So, the, so is it possible for us to arrange a meeting and have people participate in that meeting the week of the 26th, and I know that's like a vacation. Yeah, that's, that's right yeah. before yeah, vacation. I mean, I'm not there, but people well, can participate. The world doesn't stop. They have, I know that on their side, I can tell you, they have stopped the clock on anything that they were doing. So that's good news. You know, they were totally prepared to uh, engage fully and only that. You know, so it's a, it's a high focus. But so you're talking about time. the first week of September? The first Monday is Labor Day. I mean, most people, that's also a week in which people, so we're talking about the September 9th or 10th, which is the second weekend. No, no, I mean, that's, that's why too I'm far. Saying, I would think well, you have so to I'm have it in August. I, th so I think you might need two meetings. 
and when in August for who can participate and continue to wear things on the first week of September? So what, what, what week are we? I'm just trying to figure out a date. Yeah, so what is the you date you're August suggesting, 25th. Veronica? What was that? August 25th? Yeah, what was that? I mean, I leave the date up to the board. The well, board well, sets the date. The, the it, I, I just suggested the day. week of August 26th, and everybody said, oh, no. <laughs> so <laughs> Why don't we take a, who is available the week of the 19th and then who's available the week of the 26th? So who's available the week of the 19th? Of, you are? of the board Three members. Days. Is anybody board not available? Board members. I'm available, so is yeah, anybody I'm not, not sure available? I'm available or not, okay. but I can I'm, probably I'm not make it. Okay, no, Larry, yeah. you're available. Dan? Uh, yes. Um, Chairman Kane, the week of the 19th, and Donna? I'm, I'm available, Donna. Yeah. I'm not sure if Chairman The week of the 19th, I'm, I'm in. Uh, through the 21st or 27th. Yes, 21st, so, we, so, so that's good. We could do early in the you week. You do early the, in the week, 19 or 20th? Yeah, the 19th or exactly. 20th. And, you know, the consultant will be where they are, and you can give your advice, you know, and have some of the results. And in the first week of September, if that makes sense, and we have the second another week. meeting with our final report. Right. So are we talking, yeah, that would make sense. So are we talking the 19th or the 20th? I 20th would be preferable for me. Is okay. that something that would work for you, John? August 20th. Yes. 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 That's a Tuesday. In the morning, I'm assuming we're talking the same time, 10 o'clock, 9 o'clock. The 20th. Is that okay? That yep. All right, so the 20th. 20th, 9 o'clock. Yeah. Good. Okay, 20th, 9 o'clock. I don't know how long, I guess, Lance, you can kind of see and send a note around. Can we Do we need three hours? We can make it 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock. 10 to 12. 10 to 12. Yeah, I'm an early person. Never. 10 to 12. Just read issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 10. One hour. 10 to 12. 10 to 12. <laughs> Okay, so a motion, to, it's not a motion, but we will have this meeting August 20th. Do we want to schedule ahead of time, you know, pending to be confirmed at a time the first week of September after Labor Day, maybe towards the end? Uh, so everybody's back. Um, the Thursday or the Friday would be? The 5th um, or the 6th. 5th or 6th, and, you know, we will say to be confirmed on the 5th. What does 10 o'clock look, look for people? I'm just picking a date for a com for comment. The 5th? Yeah. That's fine. That's what fine. What so the 5th, week? September Thursday. the 5th at 10 o'clock. What day of the week? Uh, it is a Thursday. Thursday. Um, those are not planned to be board meetings with all the other issues. So I will ask if Teresa is out, but do we also need to plan in September and maybe we can discuss this in August, a, a date for a, a, a bigger board meeting than the regular board meetings. Mm -hmm. And if that would be, it's usually every three three months? Yeah, we need to have one every quarter. So, so um, and I guess it really depends on what are the agenda items. Maybe there are some small board issues that we can squeeze in, you know, the first mm -hmm. 15, 20 minutes and then you know, spend a minute of the time going through the reports and the mm -hmm. discussion, but again, I'll leave it up to the board to decide it. Does the board want to schedule a full board meeting in advance or talk about it in August? You know, I wonder if we could use a doodle poll for that so we can yeah. take Absolutely. into account more people Absolutely. who are here today. So, Leonora will we'll do that. Right. Thank you. Madam Chair, if I might only Acting Chair. respect the request at the end of September and the beginning of October is, I mean, not a good time. I totally <laughs> agree. Well, not a good time. <laughs> yeah, I agree. You know, we're trying to land right. this plane on zero, and I, I don't know what, <laughs> right. maybe that would be how difficult it is if you've got yeah. right. a thousand or so projects right. lined to figure out how right. to manage this down so, to zero by a date certain, but, and, and then account for all of it. No. Um, Does the board agree with that? And maybe want to, when we doodle things, we're looking more... I don't know, late October. Late October. <laughs> well, we will have had two, we will have had two board, board meetings. I, I think right. the board that be would sufficient. want to get some real-time numbers into where we landed the plane at yes. FY13, and we wouldn't 
have those numbers before what almost October. first week of November. Seven. October 7th, beginning of November. Okay, so we'll talk about it. Yeah, that's why I can give you some estimates. I would be able to give you better real numbers. Right, I think it would be better for us to have the meetings, that we, the August and the September early meetings, because we'll have given the input in the new contract and give people time to get that contract out and get it implemented and close out the past year. Mm -hmm. So I would have no problem with pushing it in pushing November. It. I don't know what other issues. We can vote on vice chair and other things at either of these two board meetings, Absolutely. and I don't know what other issues we have that are major that we want to discuss. Well, the only thing we haven't discussed yet today, are we do have two, well, we'll probably go through two, two small other items because uh, we do have time. So if everybody is good with the discussion on benchmark, um, we'll move. We have two remaining items of the, on the agenda. Um, one was... Um, to ask Larry to provide an update on the small committee. Um, there might be questions to Teresa. I think she'll be walking back, you know, back in. And then Hussein uh, wants to talk about the financial disclosure forms and, you know, checking if there's any new matters which I don't, uh, that we want to put on the agenda. So, Larry. Okay. So, um, you know, we're trying to be methodical with the discussion of issues that have been teed up in the Structure and Finance Committee of the SCU. Um, I've uh, passed around a, a two-pager front and back. Um, there are some additional copies up here. I think Lenora has, okay. Um, that summarize the issues that, that we've taken up. Um, uh, my objective for this meeting is really just to revise next steps for how we're going to, to structure this conversation. Um, I'll just note uh, under A of the handout, um, there are approved summary minutes from the um, April meeting that essentially schedule out a process for discussing some of these issues. We've, we've really rolled over all these dates, so this process is... Uh, is, is got to be updated. Um, on B, on the back page, uh, page two, there's um, five items identified here. These essentially are the issues that we've been discussing within the committee. Um, these are the issues that we're going to continue to discuss. What, what I'd like to get today is to a point where we can kind of parse out these issues and take them up sequentially because try to discuss them all at once is a, is a big bite. Um, in meeting with DDOE staff to talk about how to proceed with this, um, we thought a good, a good step would be to identify participants, identify topics, and get a date on the calendar for uh, SEU members who want to participate. To, uh, to participate. Um, finally, under C, I'll just note really quickly that we're not going to be setting up a small committee as we had initially proposed to do. We're just going to keep this within the Structure and Finance Committee, so we're, we're not really going to call it a small committee anymore. Um, that's just kind of a, uh, an aside. So this is what I'd like to do now very quickly. Um, we have a tentative <coughs> listing here of meeting participants to discuss these issues. They include DDOE staff, SCU advisory board members who are interested. We would like to get people to commit to this process who are going to stick with it, as opposed to parachuting in and out and you know, leading to um, you know, having to repeat and, and keep and get people up to date on, on things. Uh, so we would like to get advisory board members to commit to this. Um, members from uh, Council Member Che's Committee on Transportation and Environment and the OCFO. There was a conscious decision not to include the SCU staff in this. We, um, uh, we agree that the SCU staff can, can brief this committee when, when it needs to be briefed on questions that the SCU staff is knowledgeable of, that we need information on. But because it's going to be addressing issues of the contract and legislation, we thought it would be more appropriate that the SCU not be engaged since there's a, you know, obviously a conflict of interest there. Um, so... Um, any discussion with respect to meeting participants? This is the, the folks who are going to be meeting to discuss the topics that are identified one through five in uh, item B of the two-pager I sent out. 
who are the advisory board members that you're including? They haven't been identified yet. Oh. They self-select. Okay. Okay, so no further discussion on that point. Um, sorry for the folks on the phone, you don't have this, but I guess, you know, that's why I kind of abstain from this whole discussion of, of sending things out in advance, because I'm guilty of it. I, I did send it out in advance. Sorry. Um, so the, uh, the other item then is to um, identify what issues we want to take up first as, as priority questions to um, essentially make, make firm recommendations to DDOE on, on what should be done. Um, the first item is requirement the SU spend down the entire annual funding for each year to zero. Um, uh, I do want to point out before you move forward that that's not the contractual requirement. Right. So you said the requirement that they spend down to zero. I mean, that's not in their contract. They operate on the reimbursement of costs incurred. That's right. So if they spend half of it, two-thirds mm -hmm. of it, you know, then we'll evaluate based on what is spent. So there's no actual yeah. requirement that every year they have to spend to zero. But he's there's a market that should be requirement. That there should be a mark that they spend to zero? <laughs> I, no, think that, that, I think they that make their best the effort to spend to zero. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, I don't think that, that, that any... any company wouldn't spend to zero if they got the money and yeah, it's, they lose it's, it. It's really the whole implication of having to spend down your entire year's budget in a year without being able to carry it over, right. to without being able to keep it in the pocket. It's, and there, it's a different issue. It's right. a different issue, but it's it's related. And really, that's just, I guess, how I captured it. Yeah, I captured it. You, you, could, you could say that the inability to carry right. over to another year any money that is not ready to be spent. Whether so, it's necessary. Right, but so isn't the issue, though, that uh, if they don't spend the money, that it goes back to the general fund, or where does no, it go? Does that it goes, exactly. yeah, it goes back in, into the SETF, but that would then count against any additional funds that might be raised in the next year because the fund balance has to be kept capped, right? Right. Right. So, yeah, it would, let's say they only spend half their $20 million one year for the sake of argument. The following year, the SETF could only raise $10 million. It couldn't raise $20 million. Because no, the, no, the no, fund is capped? That's, 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 that's not the way. That's not the way. This is the way it works the legislation. Because no. remember, this is the surcharge on the electric and gas yeah. distribution bill. Yeah. Uh, and that, and that, that surcharge is not a just in the law. So that is an issue. If the money is not spent, the rate payers have already, you know, it's already been collected from the rate payers. Um, and what happens to it? Maybe a fund balance gets carried over, but that's an issue somebody needs to look into. Mm -hmm. Because there's no adjustment to the surcharge. Just as the way, and the way it is explained to the surcharge, yes, yeah, there would have to be an adjustment to the surcharge. I think it's, I think it's important that, that we not get into this discussion when, now. When that's conversation part. at the time. I, I just, I I just want to highlight certain things that, you know, would really help inform what issues we tackle. As it relates to the point that you're trying to raise, Larry, the fund balance. It has to be ten million in excess of the contract amount. So, say for example, next year the contract is twenty million. If the fund balance has thirty million plus one dollar in it, that is when we'll have to stop collecting the money from the utilities. But it's not the case whereby if they spend ten million this year and they have ten million left on the table that we couldn't continue to collect. You know, so it all depends on the amount that's in the fund balance. Is the contract? Plus an excess of but, ten million dollars. Well, and the member of DDOE could help you. Could we, you know, could we stop we this here? Right. The whole idea is not to have the, the conversation now. Right, it's just to identify what issues we would like well, to take up. I think this is a good one. Yeah. Yeah. I think we've identified that this is a good one. Um, well, I, I think I, I will just say that, that there's further discussion that needs to yeah, be right. taken so that you understand if it's an issue or not. Um, the uh, the second question here is performance requirements that evaluate the SEU on spending efficiency and social benefit as measured by performance outcomes on a strict annual basis. This is kind of tied to their to the whole question of, of spending down their entire budget in a year. Um, there may be some advantages to them having invested in a forward year. Um, you, know, if, you know, larger projects, for example, may not be something you could do in a single year. So there may be advantages to investing in forward years. We don't want to, we don't want to, I would argue, we do not want to uh, 
um, disincentivize the, the SU from doing that by, by holding them responsible for the full performance of every dollar they spend in a given year, if that, if that I think makes we understand sense. What you mean. Right. The, the SU contract is a one-year contract. It is. That's true. And unless we are changing major laws in the districts, as at the anti-deficiency law, and figuring out a way how we can collect all of these funds up front, then we can't even commit to a multi-year contract. So to the point here, we have to do annual measurement because it's a one-year contract. There's Let's no guarantee no that annual. they'll have this contract come yeah. October 1 of any fiscal year. The implication is not no measurement for a, on an annual basis. It's just making provisions for the possibility of... of uh, multi-year contracts. Not multi-year multi contracts, impact. but multi-year impact. So we, I mean, if that's something that the committee wants to discuss and how we you know, can track if there are multi-year impacts, that's a discussion and, that can be taken at that... And so I would recommend that if we hold it to just these two questions, it'll help better define the other questions which have to do, deal more with, I think, how we might want to revise the statute if we wanted to revise the structure of the contract or the very structure of the SEU itself. So rather than actually identifying those questions to take up in our first discussions, I'd like to just limit it to these first two um, questions, because I think they'll inform some of these other questions and whether we actually want to get into them or not. Any so discussion from that's, that's the upshot of, of uh, my report and my recommendations. And this, so this would be a continuing um, a committee meeting process. Right? Are you trying today to identify self-selected board members at this meeting, or this is a separate meeting? To the extent that members um, participating are interested, that'd be great. Otherwise, I think we need to uh, reach out by email to okay. everybody to, to get And then separate meeting times. Right. Um, I, I think Larry's identified these issues, and I think we can't discuss them now. But uh, this is something that we've discussed over time, you know, that, that uh, I'd very much like to hear from DDOE on, which is uh, these longer term, the potential of longer term projects and uh, uh, to, this is the quality versus quantity issue of, you know, we put a bunch of uh, T12 lights in versus we, uh, launch an energy efficiency project on the Empire State Building that's the equivalent yeah. of 40,000 I mean, homes, right? You know what I mean? So, uh, I think what you're saying is the contract yeah. itself has its, by the way that it's formed, and the other rules that we have in the city has certain limitations, which we want to discuss yeah. to, you know, decide right. if there's any other way uh, moving forward. But I think you have to remember that as, also that as a city, this is one of the things that we're doing for energy efficiency. So in these discussions, you know, we'll probably bring in that there's other mechanisms for other long-term contracts. If you're talking about the Empire State Building, it's PACE, it's ESCO, it's, yeah, we, it might be something else or we, a combination thereof. We would so, like to hear that because yeah, we have advocated for rationalizing where yeah. we fit in. I just have one question around the structure of these uh, meetings or even committee, Larry. As you know, what we do here with the board is open to the public. So will we be calling this a subcommittee of the board, or is this just a special group of folks that would be called to look at these issues? It is a committee of the board. It's so an established then it would committee. pretty much be open to anyone from the public who wants to walk into the room and listen to what we're talking about to participate in those discussions. I think that's, 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 that's okay. absolutely right. Then the SEU. But that then includes the, the SEU, too. The SEU, you know, that's where it was going. Because, <laughs> you know, you said you didn't want the SEU involved in this. I'm trying to figure out how do we do a meeting whereby the SEU couldn't just walk in the room. Well, of course they could. Would they want to if they weren't invited? But I, but, 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 but I take your point. I take your point. So the question is then, um, is it even possible to have these discussions outside of um, general, you know, public participation? 
I'm not sure that well, it is. Well, it's, it's a policy, it's the definition of the law. Um, is it a, a policy decisions being made? No. I mean, we'd have and, to look and, and the see committee, whether or not you can describe And it. the committee would be coming back to the full advisory board where it would be made a public, where there'd be a public you know, a participation and observation. Um, well, I think that I'd recommend the DDOE give us some guidance because they're the city agency and tell us if this can operate can, right. legally or not. If, we, if it cannot, we don't want to do it. Normally, all board proceedings have to be public. So, to the extent this is is or is not a board proceeding, it does or does not have to be public. Well, give us some. Why don't you give us some guidance as to how to have what this meeting? What the criteria would be? For yeah, what the criteria? Would be. So. A non-board meeting, a non-open meeting. Well, I, why does it matter? That we have a closed meeting. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure that, the SCU that it does. I wouldn't ask for that, but you know, the prospect that the SCU may walk in and disrupt the meeting. No, I think well, I think oh, they have. Yeah, <laughs> 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 you're suspicious characters. <laughs> well, just be the conflict. I think the real consideration is the conflict, the conflict of interest, potential conflict of interest, yeah. because yeah. a potential contractor is sitting in. Wow, discussions of I think I think they know exclusion. enough to uh, probably uh, have lunch at that time or, 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 or a, their own meeting or their weekly meeting or something like that. So they would be unavailable. <laughs> so, uh, so, say, could, could you give us some kind of a, I a reading on that? Why can't it be public? I, mean, what is I think it should just be public. Yeah. Well, yeah. can we can we kind of revisit that and get that to board? Sure. And it's and reasonable on our side. I just don't want to have the you know try to have Putting the discussion in two time. minutes and forget some of the reason you know any of the reasoning uh, behind it. I think right. that would be more uh, wise to do that. And yep. We take every comment and you know I think we um, kind of hear people. Um, any new matters? Yeah, well, we had the financial guy. disclosure forms on yes. the year. Yeah, I just want to remind uh, everyone the financial disclosure forms were due on July 1st, and I think about half the board has submitted this uh, completed form. If the other half would please complete them and send them to Lenora as soon as possible. Can you send out reminders to the board members who have not done it? And that might be a good trigger. That's a good idea. So we'll do that. Yes. Any other new matters? I think Rick. Thank you. Uh, just as a procedural matter, there were a number of board members who expressed interest in hearing more about the Open Power Program at, at a further meeting. So, just as a clarifying question, when is the next uh, advisory board meeting scheduled for, and would that be the most opportune time to, to speak further about this? Yes. The August 20th, we've sort of designated for trying to understand this other matter about the contract that's coming up. Okay. So it's up to the board about whether we could fit in another issue, but I think that's going to take most of the time, that August meeting. And whether the September meeting, that would be true, I just don't know. Just to clarify, I think um, there was an issue that was raised at the last advisory board meeting about uh, privacy concerns. We've had discussions with General Keene, with the general counsel for the DCPSC, with Richard Beverly, and the privacy issue has been resolved. So I just wanted to clarify that for the board members. Um, and also just express the sense of urgency that if the board were to be interested in a gas program, uh, time is of the essence here because we would need a contract signed within the next couple weeks by August the 1st um, in order to appropriately run a gas program for DC residents. Well, you know, I, let me say this, this, this issue has to be addressed. It's, I'm very intrigued about how that privacy issue was resolved since you certainly didn't talk to Washington Gas, which has the customers. We actually, we can talk about Yeah, so <clears throat> that would be one issue. The second issue would be Washington Gas is not authorized to do programs in the district. And do you have an opinion letter or? Yeah, yeah, we'd have to have something to show. For everybody. For everybody. Sure, sure we can share that. Thanks. You know that. Yeah, can you just send that out electronically to sure, us? Sure, I'd be happy to. 
2D DOE, and then we can we'll just do appropriate it. content. Okay. Like you can get your card afterwards. Sure. That'd be great. Well, yeah. it's, it's the essence what's, what's the Madonna? Which document is that that's being circulated? Nothing is being circulated. Um, no, no, no. Me later. Oh, well, Rick, Rick from O-Power um, is, we're talking about the fact that apparently the uh, non disclosure issue was resolved. And Nicole asked, could you say, you know, do you have an opinion, memo on that? And um, they basically have agreed that they could have one sent um, to, you know, to the board. Uh, but from there, I think I just want to make, and this is um, the process for the SEU to embark in that is surely not one of one more week. Um, you know, it's, it is a longer matter than that. I am as curious as Bernice, so this is speaking for DDOE, of seeing, you know, what has been resolved and how. Um, but at the same time, I know that your process is, first of all, there's an RP that goes out for, for behavioral program. If that was one of the programs that you wanted to do in fiscal year 14, either as planned or later, you know, later in that year. So I think it's a it's a bigger discussion for sure than a week. I just want people to have clear expectation. I think it's it, I hear all the board members saying, and I think you know we want to hear more. You know I happen to have time to I have some ideas about what it is, and I don't think everybody is as informed um, as some of you know some of us at different levels might be. So to put everybody on the same page that could be useful. I don't know that the forum, like you said, Bernie's in terms of priority. It, it is certainly not August, and I'm not sure if it's September. We've got, you know, so that's right. So maybe it's the October meeting or the meeting that's after that. Um, but in the meantime, you can share that. The, yeah, and I, and I would think that this, you know, discussion should be driven by the SEU because right. if Absolutely. the SEU does not intend to operate this program, then you know <laughs> we're, we're spending more time right. to entertain right. a proposal that the SEU, you it's know, probably will never take up. So. We completely agree. We're just trying to understand the process. Here. Yeah, yeah, Appreciate no, the clarification. Good. Yeah. Um, Miss, Mrs. Kane, I think you had Chairman Kane. Yes. Were I'm you still here. Oh, I'm just wondering if you were uh, speaking a moment ago. Um, I was checking with someone. I think you said that we were going to have the other um, SCU board meeting on September 5th. Yes. Yes. Yeah, we have a commission, commission meeting that day. I'll just have to move it to later in the day. That's all. I was just checking with somebody on that. Sorry. I should have been on mute. That's fine. <laughs> so we're all good. Um, any other new matters, Sandra? Um, at the last meeting, I understand there was some discussion as to the preparation of the advisory report and who would take the lead. This is one of those, uh, <laughs> yes. if you're not here. <laughs> um, but I have talked with my staff, and although November is going to be a crazy month for us, um, we're willing to take the lead in terms of the administrative function. As long as there is an understanding that we're going to have substantive input from other board members. But we would be willing to do that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. My staff says. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. So that's that's, that's a good, you know, that's, that's all very good. Happy news. And you can, you know, I think we can use the August and September meeting to span five minutes on, you, know, you could do this, to, to, to share where you are and to coordinate anything. Okay. And those are, we'll you know, that can be useful. Any, any new matters for the last time? Anyone want to put a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Second. Second. All yes. 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 Any All objection? Right. No. Thanks. <laughs> nice. Thank you, everybody. That was a full three hours. Yeah, sure was. Thank everybody for their yeah, yeah. It's yeah. always a marathon. Two ideas. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, what is that I want? Her candy bar. 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 Candy b